Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice, yeah, to, meet nice you. to meet you. This is a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. Um, how is yoga? <laughs> That'll go well. <laughs> oh, I fucked it up. Uh, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my joke. Whenever anyone's asked me how how was my swim, how was my yoga, how was something, I say I fucked it up. So. When when did you start getting into that, like kind of swimming and yoga and? Oh, I mean, I, you know, living on a boat in my twenties, I swim. <laughs> I had to swim a lot, so uh, you know, in order to in order to get to shore, you know. Uh, uh, but I wasn't a very good swimmer, actually. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do the crawl when I lived in the, I didn't learn how to do the crawl until I, I went to NYU. And, uh, I remember I went to the gym, I joined the gym there at NYU and, you know, in my early thirties and, uh, I would just watch other people doing the crawl cause I couldn't figure out how to do it. So, you know, I could, I could do the breaststroke. I could do, you know, that was the main thing, you know, breaststroke, I guess. Uh, but then I watched people do the crawl and now I can do the crawl. So I guess I, I was mostly swimming underwater. Uh, when I, when I was swimming, I was swimming to go check my anchors was the thing. Um, so I had to, that's all. I really just had to get down. I had to get down below. It wasn't a distance thing. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Maryland, so swimming was big, uh, there uh -huh. with, so yeah. I've been doing it since I was like six. I don't, don't do it now even with it, but yeah, always yeah. good stuff. But yeah. yeah. Then I got into yoga in, in my mid thirties. Uh, I had a girlfriend who was uh, uh, taught yoga, or yeah, somehow. So she got me a, a sort of a, a practice uh, doing it. Now it's just uh, yeah, it's just sort of a regular thing. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. When you said that, I was like, oh yeah, I forgot this guy's like a, a Brooklyn yuppie. You know, like I forgot that that was <laughs> your yoga class in the morning. You know, but uh... oh man, a Brooklyn yuppie. That's harsh. <laughs> I meant it in the, in the wow. most in most endearing terms. Yeah. yeah that's, how could you be endearing about a Brooklyn yuppie? That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. Man. Right. Right. It's my nerves. It's my nerves. Yeah. <laughs> listening to Heavy Board, and we're recording this on September 28th, 2024. My guest today is Nick Flynn. Nick is a poet, playwright, memoirist, musician, and all-around literary rock star whose work has appeared in every publication there is in the world of literature. He is the author of 13 books, six poetry collections, his most recent titled Low, out from Grey Wolf in 2023, and several memoirs, the most recent of which is titled This is the Night Our House Will Catch Fire, out from Norton in 2020. But Nick Flynn is a writer who is hard to capture by just rattling off his awards and publications. And he has many listeners, including the coveted Guggenheim and Library of Congress fellowships, as well as the Penn Martha Albrand Award for his debut memoir from 2004, Another Bullshit Night in Suck City, which was turned into a film starring Robert De Niro and Paul Dano, which we will get to, listeners. But more importantly, Nick Flynn is one of my literary heroes. As many of you have heard me say before, whenever I'm asked who are some writers I look up to, Nick Flynn is usually the first name out of my mouth. I first discovered his poetry when I was a college student, getting into the art form for the very first time. I picked up some ether, his debut poetry collection from 1999, at the recommendation of a friend, and I never looked back. I went on to devour every collection of poetry he put out. Blind Huber, a criminally underrated collection of poems, the Captain Asks for a Show of Hands, which we previously covered on this podcast, My Feelings, and I Will Destroy You. I couldn't get enough. 
Nick has been an invaluable inspiration to me and my own work since I first discovered the art forms of serious writing. And I know I'm not the only one, listeners. And I say this without any hesitation or caveats or hedging, dear listeners. With my full chest, Nick Flynn is the most innovative and boundary-pushing American poet alive. No one else comes close, listeners. And I say this not because I have him here in front of me, but because it's true. And that makes Nick a very unusual writer. A writer who has the rare combination of being incredibly daring and bold, while deeply original. The type of writer who takes risks, ranging from brutal confessional to tender sentimental, and everything in between. And it is perhaps the greatest pleasure in the history of this podcast to welcome him on Heavy Board today. Nick, thank you so much for coming on Heavy Board. Andrew, that's, that's quite something to live up to, that introduction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, the, you deserve you know, it, I mean, yeah. You, you've, had a lot of, you've, had, you, you've covered a lot of great poetry on this podcast, so I'm very honored to hear that over-the-top introduction. Uh, I find it best to butter up the guest before we... Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> no, but I meant every word of it, I'm, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you didn't say that I was criminally overrated. I mean, that would have been bad. Like, it's, it's, it's much better to be criminally underrated, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Well, that book in particular, I think, you know, it's the one everybody talks about the big books and all that. I was like, that one is the one that doesn't get enough love when when people <laughs> talk about your work. So I had to I had to put it out there, put it on the record, so to speak. Yeah. Well, it's actually had it's had a little bit of a, a, a life like it's sort of it's sort of selling. It still sells. because I think people have discovered it as an eco poetics book, a book of eco poetics right. and, and eco poetics is, you know, it was sort of before eco poetics was a thing. And now people are like teaching it as a form of eco poetics, which I think is really great. So uh, it's nice to it's nice to see this young, yes, this this sort of somewhat uh, underappreciated younger sibling uh, get some love. Yeah. So uh, I like to take a little bit of credit for that. If I've been talking it up since I've had this podcast, <laughs> but you know, yeah, of course. <laughs> and maybe I owe you some money then. Uh, hey, if you want to uh, say Venmo, yeah, I'll take. It. Yeah. <laughs> You know, right. the po po poetry money isn't real money, though, so you don't have to worry about that. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As, uh, I, could I, think... split, I, I could split my advances with you, and you still wouldn't uh, really, you still have to keep your, your job. So. <laughs> oh, isn't that the truth? Yeah. Uh, Nick, I always start this off with the same question for all writers, which is basically, I want to know, and you've written about this extensively in your various memoirs and stuff, but just to give listeners kind of an idea. You know, I like to ask, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? You know, what did your parents do? Like, how did this kind of early years start to form Nick Flynn? Sure. I mean, what do you include as early years? Can I go into my 20s or should I just keep it with like really early stuff? Uh, uh, as detailed yeah. or as vague as you want, I always yeah. say. Yeah. Or as, okay. as harrowing, you can do deep yeah. confession or. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I'll just sort of touch on a few things. I mean, I grew up in a small town. Uh on the Massachusetts coast uh, called Situate. It's a very beautiful place, uh, but it's a bit haunted for me. I don't go back very much. I don't spend the night there. Uh, I haven't spent a night there in years. Um, but it, it is very beautiful. I can see it. I brought my daughter back there uh, to show it to her, to show her where I'm from. And just, and, and it, you know, it's on the ocean. It's a, it's a, it, it wasn't a rich town when I grew up. I mean, there, there were wealthy people there, but it was mostly, it seemed like mostly like working people, like, you know, carpenters and things like that. People just working on each other's houses. And then some people would commute into the, the big city, into Boston, but it took about an hour to get there. So it, a lot of people just worked in the town. It seemed like, at least the people I knew, they, they sort of just worked in the town uh, and did, you know, there were fishermen and there were, you know, uh, carpenters and, you uh, know, stuff like that landscapers things like that um and it was you know there was something like we, we weren't we weren't a big is that your dog oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 
you have to. Oh, uh, this serious. this is the most unprofessional podcast you've ever been on. There's going to be a dog <laughs> in the background. There's going to. I have an infant, so you're going to hear her crying. Uh, yeah. You have a, you have an infant. How old's your infant? Uh, literally th- just about three weeks. It was just a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, you fucking kidding me! Congratulations. That's Thank amazing. you. Yeah, I yeah, have a, a few questions about fatherhood. Yeah. What's and, her What's What's her name? What's her name? Uh, L. 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 Beautiful name. Wow, that's great. That's great. Thank so you. So you. So you. So you haven't had any sleep. You're still like in the, the beautiful. <laughs> The beautiful hallucination stage, right? Yes. Uh, none of this is real anymore. Okay, so well, you should have told me that because that's a whole different thing. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, so my childhood stuff was it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, how, how does one become a poet? I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> like really, like from that, from that childhood, like there was nothing pointing toward poetry. There was no poetry really in my life. Uh, it wasn't like we were, we were in a book. We had books around my house, but they weren't like, you know, they weren't like uh, the center of the life. You know, they weren't like they were sort of dusty books in the shelves. And, you know, there were a few books we had in my mother's bed. Uh, she did have she did keep Ariel, uh, you know, Sylvia Plath's Ariel. Uh, I remembered that very clearly next to her bed, um, which is, you know, uh, everyone's favorite, you know, sad poet. Uh, and, uh, uh, so that was, that was, that was there, but I didn't, I don't think I looked at it. I didn't look at it. I, I sort of knew the book, but I didn't, didn't look at it. Um, uh, my grandmother had like books up in her attic that were just sort of stored away from her divorce and, and they were sort of hard to get to. You had to cross the, uh, the joists, you know, in between pink insulation. You had to do like tight, tight rope across to this sort of shelf. You know, they were just sort of like laid on the against the wall on the shelf. All these books, and I, I spent time looking at those. I sort of went up there. There was a couch up there for some reason. It was a you know completely unfinished attic, and I would get a book and take it and look through it and stuff. And I thought that was interesting. Um, but there was a bookstore in our town, and you know, I remember the first book. I remember buying a book because uh, I liked horror stuff. I was kind of a, a morbid child, and. Uh, the first poem I memorized was uh, they asked us to memorize a poem in fifth grade or sixth grade. And I, I memorized, uh, you know, Pose the Raven, which is quite a long poem. Uh, and you know, it was an ambitious, an ambitious thing to do. But I, I really like liked Poe, uh, you know, the, 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 those morbid horror stories. Uh, I really liked them. So uh, but I remember like a few years before that I had bought a book um, at the bookstore uh, uh, the uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by I think it's I think it's Robert Louis Stevenson, I think, maybe, I can't I forget right now. The but facts uh, don't matter on this podcast. Yeah, well, facts yeah. Matter. Yeah. listeners yeah. will put it in the comments. They'll be like, well, actually, yeah. Nick didn't know yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be, be kind. Uh, so I bought the uh, I bought that book and then I, I, I took it home because I really liked. I, I think I'd seen the movie. I knew about it. And I was like, oh, there's a book of this. And I brought it home and I couldn't read it. I couldn't read like the first page of it. I was too young. And I'm like, okay, in two years, I'm going to be able to read this. And then two years later, I read the whole book. It was, it was very exciting. It was an exciting thing. But almost everything I know about reading and writing came outside of school. Like I don't remember anything of school. It's, it's, I'm really a, I'm kind of a terrible parent in a way. Our daughter's 16 now. And I'm really, I'm just sort of like, Ah, high school doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> you're like, like you're not gonna remember any of it anyway. She's sort of like she's really into it, and she seems to remember it all. She's much more present than I I was. I mean, she's much more like just emotionally and just in this world and just sort of taking the world in in a way that I never did. I don't remember anything from my childhood. <laughs> I remember stuff outside of school. I read books outside of school. I read books you weren't supposed to read outside of school, and I wrote things outside of school. And that's all I remember is from that. So it was just a it was it wasn't you know wasn't part of what we did in school at all and not that there were good english teachers i remember my you know my school had those were the only people i really liked was the english classes i, I didn't understand anything else it was just i didn't have many other options because i there was nothing else i really could do or wanted to do uh and so i was always just thinking like for some reason that i would be a writer uh hard to say why it just sort of that's what that's what appealed to me. Language appealed to me. Uh, and the, the idea of building something from, um, you know, from words, like creating a world from words just seemed really kind of magical. Uh, I think because I think maybe because the world I was in was was difficult. And, you know, to create this alternate reality seemed like a really like nice 
uh, way out. And, you know, so I would go to bookstores. I'd, there was a bookstore I'd go live in. I'd just sit and read all the books. And, uh, you know, one, once, I, once I got locked in there, like at, at lunchtime, the person just left. They didn't notice me there. And I, I realized I could... I could have just walked out with all the books I wanted because it, it was, but I, but I didn't do it. And I was a little thief too, but I wouldn't, I didn't want to steal from this bookstore because I was like, I, I need to be able to come back here. You know, I need to be able to come <laughs> back to this bookstore. So it'd be very bad if I did that. But now, the reason I asked about going into my 20s was just that um, lately I'm writing a book now about being in my 20s. And there's been a box of notebooks in my attic for, you know, years now that I've been reluctant to open it. I just ha didn't want to know who that person was. And now in the last like, you know, month or so, I've gotten the box, I've read a bunch of the notebooks, and I'm sort of reintroducing, getting reintroduced to who I was in my 20s, which is really an in fascinating thing. It's, it's I'm not, I, I wasn't as bad a person as I thought I'd be. Somehow <laughs> I thought I'd be, I, I don't know, because I was, I was also like a little, you know, uh, you know, it was before I got sober. I got sober in my late 20s. So this would have been when I was still using and you know, doing drugs and alcohol and just, I just thought, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I thought I'd find. And I just didn't want to see that person again. And now yeah. it's been quite nice. It's actually, I have quite a bit of uh, compassion now for that, that younger self, uh, which is interesting. And, and I also can see, you know, trying to be a writer. Like I kept these notebooks and I was trying to be a writer, even though I didn't have, and, and there were a lot of quotes from other people I was reading. So it's really nice to see the quotes of like, you know, Borges and, uh, uh, Flannery O'Connor and, and, and Rilke and just in the, in the margins, just like writing all these quotes of people that were like, you know, resident quotes. Like, and, and yeah, it's, it's wild. It's really wild. That's uh, great. I, I mean, I love the, I love the idea of like keeping all of that stuff too. Like even if you don't even have a reason, you're not doing it consciously, right? But there's just something you can't throw away these, these scraps of paper for some reason. And like you said, carrying it around for 40 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's what it is but I, I always ask like the next question kind of like what you know what made you get into writing and reading and how did you find it and kind of and you said it was kind of like an escape from like kind of your childhood your life or a fantasy or, or... It's, it's hard it's hard to say how I got into it because when I was like 12 uh, I had a friend who I hung out with for one summer we were in Boy Scouts together and I convinced this friend that we should spend the summer writing I was reading Sherlock Holmes then, and that we should we should spend the summer. The best way to spend the summer would be to like try to write a story like Sherlock Holmes, and we wrote like so we'd get together in the afternoons. We'd write. We got like 50 pages written of this thing set in the most exotic locales I could imagine, which were uh, uh, Scotland and Egypt, and it was just this thing. And I, so it, it, it's a very strange thing to do to like like okay, I get a good idea. I I know a good way to spend the summer. We'll write something. <laughs> You know, and he went. He was game. He went along with it. But then a few years later, uh, like I was probably 15 or 16, and which is my daughter's age, which is interesting. Um, uh, we, I spent a summer with another friend. So I was reading like Kurt Vonnegut then, mm. and trying to write like a science fiction story. So I, I and I always somehow I thought it was always collaborative that you wrote with someone else, uh, and you sort of like you, you bounced ideas off each other, and like you, you did this thing. So it was always like a fun. It was it was just a fun thing to do. Like I, and then and then in college, I always had a typewriter set up in my dorm room. And whenever you came in, you had to type something on the typewriter. You had to like you had to do something. Uh, and it was just you know, there was always this collaborative element to it. And, you know, I, I just sort of wanted to be whatever I was reading. Like I was like, OK, yeah, maybe this is the kind of writer I am. You know, maybe this is uh, the thing. And then I became a poet. Uh, I was at UMass and somebody and I, I was in English. English, I was, you know, uh, English major, undergraduate. Uh, I, I was, I, I took a couple of years off after high school and just worked. I worked as an electrician, uh, you know, quote unquote electrician. I mean, it was an electrician, but it was also working for gangsters. It was like this sort of very shady organization I was working for. Um, that my mother was, her boyfriend was, you know, the main gangster, and it was just a whole very shady time. Um, and so, but then I, I, I ended up going to school, and studying English, I sort of knew, and I could say, because, you know, we had no money, but I knew from doing that work that I could make money. I knew that I, I, I had a trade. I could be an electrician. I could, like, okay, I could make, you know, I could make money. So I can, so school was a way for me just to, like, not to just study what I wanted to study, which was literature 
and, and, and writing. So I took creative writing classes. And at some point, like my last semester I was there, I dropped out, I dropped, I dropped out of uh, college, but uh, the, it, what turned out to be my last semester was um, I heard there was a poet that was teaching there named James, James Tate, uh, who was, uh, you know, he was probably 40. I think he had won the Pulitzer when he was 25 or something. Uh-huh. Like he was just like this, uh, uh, or, or he was Yale series of younger poets. I mean, uh, he was just, he was a very renowned poet. Like he was young, young, you know, 40 years old and had already had like several books. And, and I didn't know there were, you know, I was studying English liter- literature. I was studying like, you know, like, you know, Beowulf and, and, and the fairy queen and things and, and reading Faulkner. And I was like, Oh, there's, there's living poets. I didn't really even, that didn't really, I, I didn't connect to that. I was, you know, 22 years old. And, uh, so I took this workshop with uh, with with James Tate, and uh, it kind of destroyed me. It kind of like like <laughs> you know, we read a we read a book a week, a, a contemporary book that came out that year, and I can still remember like all the titles that we read. Uh, you know, Michael Burkhart, uh, Carolyn Forche, Lizelle Mueller. Uh, uh, yeah, there's just this like you know beautiful Etheridge Knight. Uh, there's just this beautiful, you know, 14 books, read one a week and just talked about them, wrote like maybe a page or something about it and just had a discussion. And it was just like, I was like, oh, this is, this is the thing. This is like the way my mind works. Like my mind works like these poems. I didn't understand all the poems. The poem, there was a whole, whole range. I mean, the difference between like Michael Burkhart and Etheridge Knight is like, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a, a world in between those two poets. Uh, but I was like, you could do anything. Greg Orr. Greg Orr was a huge influence from that that thing. His one of his, I think, the Red House. One, I think, one of, might have been his first book or second book. Uh, you know, huge influence. Uh, and I was just like, oh, you can you can do this in this like you could have like in like you know, Greg Orr has these like distilled moments that had so much power that just you know you know talking about, and also talking about like really difficult things. Like this was, uh, you know, Greg Orr's. Uh, uh, you know, book talks about, you know, one, one of his main stories of his life is that he accidentally shot his brother when he was young and killed his brother. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's this thing that sort of haunts all his poems. And this is sort of a, that book sort of goes into it, goes into that moment uh, in, in a, you know, all his books touch on it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a thing that sort of runs, a thread that runs through all his work, I think, I would say. Um, and that you could sort of like, you know, touch something so deeply uh, traumatic and, you know, craft something that didn't sort of resolve it at, in any sense, but let it just sort of still be in the air as like this, this un, uh, incomprehensible uh, energy uh, floating around. It was just so powerful to me. It was so powerful. Carolyn Forche going to, you know, El Salvador and, and writing uh, her uh, you know, the country between us and just sort of like bringing politics. I was, I was sort of political at that point too. I, I was becoming political. Uh, you know, there was a whole, uh, a lot of stuff going on in Central America with the, the death squads, U S funded death squads and things in the eighties. Uh, you know, <laughs> sure. Glad that's behind us. We don't fund, <laughs> we don't fund any death squads now. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, so so that that she could sort of bring the political in with uh, this personal uh, stuff, and there were sexy poems too. There were also right. very sort of you know sexy poems and like you know really amazing. Uh, Etheridge Knight writing from prison. Uh, yeah, just just there's it just seemed like oh, this is like poetry can do anything. It can just do anything. Like it just, I was so excited by it. And then, then I tried, and then I tried, and I couldn't write a fucking good poem for years. <laughs> for years, I tried to write poems. I was like, you know, I was sort of. I was sort of destroyed by trying to, you know, listening to too much, you know, too many lyrics, uh, you know, you know, rhyming, you know, ballady couplets and uh, just old English verse that I had to like sort of break out of that, you know, like like break out of that and sort of find my own my own voice. So, yeah, that's that was yeah. a big thing. That's I mean, all the questions that I, that, that I always ask next is kind of like, you know, the first writers that you start getting into and you were rallying them off, you know, Vonnegut, I think is always a huge one. We love Vonnegut on this podcast that you mentioned kind of, and I I think that's a big one for, for, for writers that are starting, like trying, they want to be that, you know, like when you read these people, you're like, Oh, I want to be that. 
but you yeah, said like kind of getting into the political too like I, I wanted to ask you about music and kind of your influences with that too kind of like it's particularly the punk rock kind of influences because i think that's also not a common story, but a story that I think a lot of writers share with this kind of their first introduction to kind of lyrical, you know, putting words together and trying to make meaning out of them is like music. And, and punk, of course, is very interesting to me. I have some roots in that as well. But yeah, like how, how did music come into this in terms of getting you into poetry and writing? And You know, probably like the biggest influence lyrically back then was probably The Clash. Um, oh, yeah. The early, the early <laughs> Clash albums, uh, you know, uh, were like, you know, I really sat up. I mean, I, I listened to a lot of music, but, you know, The Clash was like really important because they're also, they, you know, they're political and they were angry and they were, uh, you know, but they were also telling stories and uh, there was little little stories within each song. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I would say like that. And, and in my 20s, you know, in this time, which is so weird, it's so weird to read this these notebooks too because I don't talk <laughs> about the stuff I really did. Like, I went to music every night. Like, you know, I saw so many bands because you, you go, you could go relatively cheaply, just go to a bar. I was gonna go to, a, I was gonna be in a bar anyway, so why not go to a bar that had music? Uh, and you know, I, saw, I got, I got to see great music like through my twenties. And I, there's not a, there's almost not a word of like the bands I went to in these notebooks. Like, it's if that didn't, that wasn't part of like I hadn't figured out how to integrate my life. You know, how to like sort of integrate the life into it. There's a, <laughs> there's a moment. There's, this is crazy thing too. In the notebooks, I'll get back to the music in a second, but in the notebooks, um, you know, my father becomes homeless in, you know, 1987. I have the notebook from 1987. I have the notebook from the time he became homeless. I don't fucking mention it. <laughs> in the notebooks, like, it's like, wait a minute. Like, I know this. Then there's like a little, like, like a little glimmer of it. It's like, you know, so it's, you know, my compassion comes from realizing, like, it's something I couldn't even touch it. Right. You know, there's certain things I couldn't even write about. I couldn't even touch it. But I don't know why I couldn't write about music, though. That was like that was a fun part. Uh, um, yes, yeah, getting to see this music. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, and I think it did musically. You know, I, I guess you'd say like the. You know, lyrics don't usually work as poems, you know, right. like it's not like a, it's a whole different beast. Uh, you know, Neil Young is like, you know, gr one of the greatest songwriters. But when, if you just read his, read his lyrics outright, like this, this is nothing, you know, <laughs> it's like, there's, not, there's not a whole lot here. Right. Yet somehow they, 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 they're such amazingly beautiful songs, you know, like it's like it's magic. It's a magic thing, that combination. And, you know, it's, his lyrics are good, he, but he's not a lyricist like like a like a, a Leonard Cohen, you know, who's really as a poet also, you know, he's right. like he's another he's another beast. He's another beast, you know, like like Lou Reed is like. I mean, Laurie Anderson says Lou Reed would just like write write a song literally in like 30 seconds. You would just like, yeah. like, like write something out really quickly and then just sort of, you know, that would be it. Whereas, you know, other people, you know, I think I think Hallelujah took him, what, seven years to write, you know, like, <laughs> right. you know, uh, so, yeah, so it's a different thing. So but music is, you know, I, uh, it's always it's always sort of part of things. And like, and like you said, I have some I, I do work with musicians. I have like bands. That I work with now, that I've worked with for a while, for at least at least ten years, maybe more. No yeah. more. Yeah, I've worked with a composer for uh, Guy Barash for like uh, like sixteen years because I met him when my daughter was an infant, was three weeks old, like your like your L. Yeah, uh, yeah. I met, I met him when she was tiny. I remember it was like he called and asked me to. If, if you could use one of my poems to make a song out of one of my poems. And I was just so grateful to leave the house for like an hour uh, to go get a coffee with a stranger. I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's one of my questions too. Like kind of your, when you started doing kind of your music project, I think I've heard in other interviews when I was researching this, you know, kind of you said around 2016 ish or something was when you kind of do a start of your band Killdeer and you kind of started doing performances and making music. I imagine, you know, you, you did music kind of like, did you play music when you were younger in your 20s and stuff? And then kind of, you know, in 2016, you were kind of, you know, you already the public figure of Nick Flynn and then coming out kind of doing music too. You know, what made you want to do that? And then even going off the, sorry, I know I have long questions here, but it's, uh, you know, what does that do uh, for your creativity and writing practice? You know, kind of having another creative out, outlet uh, on top of writing. and Yeah, well, like I said, like I, I've always, you know, like the first, my first, idea of what writing was 
was as a collaborative project, which makes no sense to almost any other writer. <laughs> like, uh, and but that's some reason that made sense to me. Uh, and so collaboration with other artists has just always been part of my practice. Like I've always like, I really find it fascinating to take a poem, uh, you know, a poem that I've worked on and then put it through other mediums. Like, like what, what would happen if a sculptor, what would a sculptor do with this poem? You know, what would a, what would a filmmaker do with this poem? What would a, a dancer, how would a dancer interpret this? Like just to see, right. and, it, and it's not, it, it's, you know, so that becomes a thing in itself, that performance, whatever it is, but it also will bring back, will reflect back on the poem, and I'll probably usually change the poem because I'll see something that I hadn't seen, I couldn't see before, but it's only, you know, words on a page. It's this very strange medium. I mean, you know, writing is a is a is one of the stranger mediums that we work with. I mean, paint makes sense. Paint is made out of mountains and and stones. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's you grind up minerals and make paints. Uh, you know, dance is the body. Uh, but what the fuck is writing? I mean, it's like, it's, it's like, it's breath, you know, is that, is that writing? Like, like the, 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 the noises that come out of your mouth? Is it the, 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 the pictures you get in your brain when you look at like marks on a page? Like, it's like, it's really weird. Like, it's right. really fucking weird. So to put it in other mediums, uh, just releases other energies, other possibilities of it. So the band thing was just like, like a natural progression. Like, so it was before 2016, it was 2008. Uh, I began working with, uh, cause my daughter was born in 2008 and, uh, that's when I began working with Guy Barash. Like he came and asked if he could do, just make one of my poems into a song. And then he, he and I have done something on every book since we take, I've gone to him. He's like my composer. I think that each poet should have a composer. You know, I think each poet should have a filmmaker. I mean, each, each filmmaker should also have a poet, you know, like, it's just <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it's, you know, so I have like, you know, I have a photographer. He's he's like, you know, I think he's my photographer, you know. And then when they when they work with another poet, I get very jealous. You know, I get very <laughs> like, like, wait a minute, you're you're my photographer. Like, <laughs> but I have to work on that. I have to work. On that. So so with Guy, like, you know, we did a whole thing with uh, my second memoir uh, called "The Ticking Is the Bomb," and he and I did a whole series of. I just he said like, well, what can we do and you know, how could we work together on this book? And I said, well, there's a whole thread that goes through it of Proteus, you know, the myth of Proteus. Maybe if we just extracted that, it's it spread out over the whole book. But if we extracted that and sort of saw if we put them next to each other and then, then we worked on that musically and we have a whole like series called Proteus. Um, and then before from doing that, it changed the writing. I went, when I went back into the writing, like it changed it because I was, you know, working on it musically. And so it, it has the music in it, in the book now, in the version that's published in the book, it has the music in it, but you don't see it. You know, you just sort of, it's, it, it, it has made it a little wonkier in some way because uh, you sort of, it's inflecting this energy into it. And the last book, Low, uh, uh, I've, I've performed that with the band, a lot with the band, but that, that was a slightly different uh, process because that was during COVID. So the band thing wasn't really happening so much, but I, they're all based on, um, on a, uh, uh, these collages that I, do. I have a collage practice also where I've, I've been making collages since I was in my twenties. I've been, you know, it's, it's, it's like the art form that most speaks to me. Like I'll go see a Rauschenberg show and, you know, I, I think Rauschenberg's amazing, but I really like his little collages, like just little, like sort of tossed off collages, just, you know, to me have the most energy, these Dada strange little moments put together. Uh, so I, I wrote a poem a day for like a month and then I did it for another month, a poem a day for a month. Uh, and that became the basis of the, uh, based on these collages. Uh, and that became the, basically the, the basis of the a book low of low. Um, and then from that, then I performed them with the band. I performed a lot, a lot of the poems with the band. That changed them also, that changed the texture of them. And then I also worked with an AI, uh, uh, a lab in Toronto uh, where uh, but we didn't really change it much of that because the book was already out. So the, the book was pretty much together. So that just sort of added a whole other level of it, uh, this other level of it. I had to figure out which ones would work with AI to make a film, to make this sort of film of uh, a live film as I'm reading. Um, so it's just always that, like each each book or each book has like all these other things that feed into it that make it the book. Like it's not just me sitting with a pen and writing the poem. Right. Like there's always... There's always like, like, 
a handful of other people that are like, like, like influencing me and like sort of like giving me like, like energy and ideas and like, you know, possibilities. Like, you know, if you taking, taking your poems and running them through, like, I don't, the, the AI doesn't change the poems. The AI just generates images. Uh, it's a, it's a voice activated image generator. So the poems are, you know, I'm, I'm not into chat GPT to write poems right? at this point. It doesn't, they seem kind of dumb to me, right. but, uh, but what it can do, like how it hallucinates on a screen when it's listening to you is really fucking interesting. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's like a, uh, one of the sort of latest collaborations I've done with that, uh, with yeah. those things. Yeah, there's, you know, when I was right out of college, I worked at this cigar shop for a while, you know, just, you know, minimum wage type job. There was this kind of a local poet who would come in. His name was Gary Blankenberg, and I had never heard of him before. And, you know, he was never a huge name. He taught at one of the kind of local schools where I grew up there in Baltimore. But he, when he found out that I was into poetry, he would bring me things. He would bring me books or he would bring me like a painting or something. And he always said that, like, you know, a lot of writers, poets have to have another outlet other than just writing. And I've been thinking about this, you know, it's kind of a theme on the podcast. We kind of constantly, you know, orbit around the limits of language. Like language can only do so much. And like, you kind of need these other forms Like you said, mm -hmm. dancing, uh, painting, music, like these kind of other forms to inform the writing and all of that. And I just, that's just, obviously, I mean, we're not gonna get any answers. And, and this isn't the type of podcast where we're looking for definitive answers, just your thoughts and all that on this kind of stuff. But yeah, I just, how, yeah. how did you how did how did you get into uh, poetry? That's a, did, did, when you were at the cigar shop. Was that after you had done an undergraduate thing or a graduate yeah. thing? Or? After I'd done an undergraduate, and I was applying yeah. to MFAs uh, and getting rejected mostly. <laughs> it took me two uh -huh. years to get in, and then. Uh, so yeah, I got into it. I was probably around 19 in community college uh, in Baltimore. Shout out CCBC, and it was yeah. like. Uh, Music. It was music, which is why I always ask writers and stuff about that, especially somebody like you who's written about it and talked about your kind of music influences and stuff and, and current projects. It was yeah. always music. And for me, it was punk. But of course, I'm probably ha I'm about I'm 35. So I'm like younger, but, uh, you know, Rancid, Green Day, these types of things that I discovered in, you know, when I was in middle school. And then from that getting turned on to, you know, they love the clash. So then I got into the clash and then, you know, these other kind of the early days of punk was, was really, really. And then of course in college I got into indie rock and I, yeah, modest mouse, which I wanted to talk to you about with <laughs> my Isaac Brock is touched me in a place where I'm still to this day, you know, just mm -hmm. will always go back to those albums and listen to them and stuff. And yeah, it kind of gave me that idea that you could, manipulate these words around and you could get something out of it they would make you feel something or they'd make you free associate something you know like just kind mm -hmm. of the people say it's power and yeah maybe it is you know the kind of power in it but i i yeah that's basically what got me started and then of course i got introduced to your work and all of that which was you know when you said um you're uh, getting introduced to contemporary, like, oh, living poets, because you're taught in school all these dead poets, and then you get into living poets. And I had really good teachers uh, when I was in undergrad there, particularly, uh, shout out, Leslie Harrison. She was a, quite a mentor to me. Well, at, uh, well, I know Les. I know Leslie, yeah, yeah. she's great. And she introduced me uh, to some of your stuff because she saw what I was doing or trying to do, and she was like, you know, you should read Nick Flint. And I was like, who's that, you know? and picked it up and again as i said in the introduction you know absolutely consumed by it read everything and then um yeah just kind of kept snowballing you know from there kind of getting into more and more contemporary stuff you know and, yeah that's great that's yes yeah, it's wild how it sort of takes it doesn't take with everyone but you know i teach undergrads not not every year but uh you know i, I haven't taught for i've taught grads the last several years, but uh, I, I like teaching undergrads too, because that when they sort of see like the possibilities of poetry, uh, it's really beautiful. And also I'm just sort of amazed when I'm teaching undergrads now, like in Houston with this economy and with this like thing, I'm like, what do you think poetry is going to do for you? Like what, <laughs> you know, like, 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 like what, you know, like what, what is going on? Do you think this is going to be easy? Or do you think that like, are you really interested in this? Is this like, what is the, what is the thing? And some people are, you know, that, that they're still, you know, this uh, energy around poetry as like a somehow a, a way to 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 make meaning and to sort of like that that it's a form that does make meaning uh, is, is really beautiful. Um, and I was, I was also thinking of when you were talking like of uh, the other, 
you know, other streams feeding poetry, you know, yeah. Billy Collins, they, they, you know, they asked Billy Collins, what's the hardest thing about being a poet? And he's like, it's figuring out what to do with the other 23 hours a day. <laughs> um, that like, you know, cause I do think like writing poetry, like my creative energy for anything is about an hour. It really, right. it's about the same as Billy Collins. It's like, you know, uh, it's, I have about an hour of like good generative creative energy. If I can do it at the right time, it's really beautiful. I don't always get it. Sometimes I do it and terrible things come out, but that's like it. And then after that, it's just sort of like moving things around, moving furniture around, like sort of like, you know, taking care of business, moving, you know, uh, doing things. But so, you know, other people like painters don't have like, you know, they're, they're like in the studio, like 12 hours a day because right. they have stuff to do. You know, they have things to do that they have to sort of keep working on. We, it just gets worse if we do it. Like, you know, we have to be in the world. We have to like go out in the world and like just, just be in that, that state of reverie and just allowing like the world to, you know, to, to pour into us so that we then can, can come back out of it again. It's a very strange job. Uh, and I, you know, I wouldn't say it's a lazy job because the other stuff is really important too. Like all the stuff that you do to get in shape for that one hour is really important. You know, you have to sort of do everything, you know, you can't just go fuck off for like, you know, sit and like, you know, eat Cheetos and watch porn for 23 hours, <laughs> you know, like, like that's not going to create good poetry, you know, in the end, like that's going to, uh, you know, that, that'll have an effect on your creative output, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you sort of have to figure out like things to do. That's why, you know, we talked about, I don't know, that might've been before we even got onto the podcast here, but about, you know, I just got out of a yoga, you know, I do yoga. <laughs> have a yoga class and like, you know, like I have to do something like that right. every day, one or two things like that every day, something physical, something spiritual, something, you know, read like, like, you know, connect to community, uh, be good to another person. Uh, there's all things that one must do, uh, in order to become the person who can write that poem. Uh, you know, which that's the whole thing that I think Machado says that, right? Like I, I heard it from Stanley Kunitz first, like if you, but I think he got it from Machado. Uh, if you read a po poem you love uh, and you want to figure out how to do it, you have to figure out how to become the person who can write that poem. Uh, you know, which is, it sounds very simple, but it's like it's it's <laughs> it's changing your entire life. You know, it's like you know, yeah, to become that person. Yeah, it's it's this. I think a lot of people that don't do creative things, they they don't understand how much stamina kind of it does take to create something out of nothing. And you know, let's don't want to talk about, oh this is the special thing we do but it's it's just kind of it is poets, this... poets, are, poets are the hardest working people in the world <laughs> now I, I, I said that as a joke once to like a group of people i was like i was like i'm fucking kidding like <laughs> but it is hard though but it is hard yeah. it's like... <laughs> yeah. and you you have to do these things like you have to yeah mind and body right yeah you spiritual and body is kind of you keep it connected keep that in shape so you can keep the kind of poetry creative muscle in shape because at the end of a session, I mean, you do feel drained. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm always impressed by writers that can do three, four hour sessions or all day sessions, you know, like, I mean, it's more fiction writers that do that kind of thing, of course, but it's just like, you know, you, you write long form in terms of memoir and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that in terms of the process here. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, but still, I want to ask you about memoirs, you know, one of your craft forms of choice, you know, like, like kind of, you know, one, why memoir? And, and two, how did you get into these kind of ideas of writing memoirs? Like, how did, how did that happen? Did you just fall into it? Was it just by accident? You know, how did you fall on that? You know, because most people that are writing books are like, oh, you wrote a poetry book. And then they're like, oh, I'll just, I'll write fiction now or I'll, you know, do something like that. But you've taken the memoir route, you know, how is that? Yeah. I, I think um, I think I would agree. I think Maggie Nelson said in an interview once that she just doesn't understand. I think she said she doesn't understand the fictive impulse like that. Like like and I kind of, you know, I read that resonated with me just that uh, it, it's I don't completely understand. And, and I have much less tolerance for fiction also. Like I, I read beautiful, you know, there's, you know, books of fiction that I just absolutely love. But I'm, I can walk away from a book of fiction very easily if I'm sort of like, yeah, I get what they're doing. I get this is just this is making all this up and it's not really uh, doing it for me. Um, you know, uh, whereas nonfiction, I'll be a little more. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm more generous because it also has to be well written. It has to be like beautifully written. But, uh, you know, you are sort of getting something from the world. It's like the idea of someone in a memoir, like, you know, in a good memoir, I mean, 
a bad memoir is like really a terrible thing. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's one of the worst things you could do. It's like, you know, going to, to read a bad memoir. Uh, but when it's done well, uh, and you know, the author is really like, sort of like, like balancing that, um, on that line between the internal, uh, self, like the, the, the way that they're perceiving the world and then the actual coming up against the, 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 the reality of the world and like that tension that gets created, like, you know, we want the world to be a certain way or we met, remember the world a certain way or we, you know, uh, we, we were led to. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board to get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast. Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Believe the world was a certain way, but then this is this is the way it, it seems to be at this moment. Um, it just seems to be a really like a vibrant uh, energy to that that uh, I, I haven't come to the end of yet. I keep thinking I'm going to maybe try. I mean, I've done a I did a play. I wrote a play, which is, you know, definitely more it, it's, you know, it's 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 a creating characters and stuff and that's that was kind of interesting uh uh so yeah i mean it's not it's not outside the realm of what i might do but i i, I just haven't come to the end of um being fascinated with the actual stuff of the world so now like i'm back in like i i, I you know it's it's I'm, I'm i'm writing about living on a boat in my 20s like and it's just like it's just something that I haven't like really you know I touched on it in in the first memoir I just sort of touch on it, it's a, but it's sort of a it, it was a big thing it was, a, it was sort of a very big thing and it's a strange thing too like I'm reading these notebooks now too these these notebooks from my twenties, and I lived on my I lived on boats from the time I was like nineteen until I was like thirty one, like for a long time, like a long time like for long periods of time I was just just on a boat, and. I ended up working on boats, ended up like getting a captain's license. And it was really was a big part of my life. Uh, and and it's a strange thing. It's a very strange thing to do, a strange choice to make. And I'm trying to understand it, too. I'm trying to understand that that, you know, that choice. And again, I don't talk about it a lot in the notebooks. It's just sort of it's like a fish, you know, swimming doesn't doesn't talk about the water it's swimming in because it's just that's, that's just your daily reality. You know, so somehow I'm like, I'm like, I, I want more. I, I wanted to have like stuff of the boat all the time on each page. I thought they'd be like, you know, filled with like nautical terms and, you know, like, like I had to go dive on my anchors today and yeah, none of it, none of it. Just like, that was just sort of like what I did every day. And then I, I, and writing was something else. Writing was sort of getting at something else, which, you know, I didn't figure that out about integrating my life. I really didn't get that. Like that the, you can do whatever you're looking at right now in front of you is the most valuable thing. Uh, you know, there's some reason to figure out why you are sitting here looking at that thing right now is what's interesting and not whatever you think it should be, you know, whatever yeah. you imagine it should be. So we're just kind of like, yeah, like what resonates and what sticks, you know, especially you mentioned being younger, you know, you're, you're, you're not even paying attention to the, yeah, the what the hell is water, right? The DFW line kind of, yeah, like the kind of what yeah. everything around you is just there and you're like, oh, I'm trying to be this. So you're not even paying attention yeah. to, to, yeah. The, to the things that... Is there a different process? Like, is there a different process between poetry, memoir, and even playwriting and stuff? Or is it just kind of the same, you know, don't think about it too hard? Or, yeah, we're kind of a writing literature podcast, and listeners like to know these kind of details about, yeah, do you do yeah. anything differently when you're writing a memoir versus writing a book of poems? Or, Well, the you know, the, the, the memoirs all are, you know, they're contained in somehow in, like, uh, you know, time and place, uh, you know, they have like a certain energy around that. Like it's, it's, it's usually, it's not like the whole, you know, it's not, it's not everything in the world is sort of contained, uh, in time and place. You're trying to sort of contain that energy. Um, uh, and by, by just going deeper into that moment, like sort of like drilling down into those moments, um, you know, what you do with poetry too, but with poetry, it can, you know, the shape of a book of poetry 
is often revealed, you know, much later. Like, you know, the only, you know, there's a couple books I've done that you could call project books. Uh, the Blind Huber would probably be considered now a project book. It was also before there were, before we talked about project books. Um, uh, the uh, the Captain Asked for a Show of Hands would probably be a project book. And so I sort of did have a sense of like, a, this is like, it almost felt more memoir-like in that sense, because you were sort of in a thing where other other books are like collections of poems that right. somehow are just, are just sort of like tracking like the five years in, in you know, that it took to write those and was sort of what's sort of like what's happening around that moment or something. Uh, yeah. Rather than going back into some, some era. Uh, yeah. I, I, I write them the same. I really write them uh, the same, I think, except the, you know, the, the nonfiction, you do have to stay with it a lot longer. You have to sort of like figure out a way to um, uh, keep it alive in you. Whereas with a poem, you can, write a poem and then walk away from it and then go live your life. Uh, that's why I, I, I prefer writing poems because <laughs> then you get to like actually be alive, more alive. <laughs> uh, whereas when you're writing nonfiction, you sort of get like, you kind of got to, you kind of split, you know, you're a little bit split. Like you're not fully alive because you're, you know, right now I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm you know, spending a lot of time encountering my 20 year old self, you know, uh, and like, you know, but I have a 16 year old daughter. Like, what, what the fuck? Why have I, I don't need to, I don't need to encounter a 20 year old self. You know, like. <laughs> yeah. And there's like threads, right? Whereas like long form writing, you have to follow that thread and you can't just snip it after you're done doing a draft, you know, and then go on and come back to it later. I mean, you could, but then you lose that thread and it's not the quite the same. And it's, so I'm always yeah. just curious about, yeah, like how that works out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find just ways to like, you know, I don't, I haven't gotten into people talk about all these different like tools that they work with, Scrivener and stuff like that, <laughs> mind clouds, uh, you know, mind maps and things like that, which I think are great. My wife does that. My wife is actually is just finishing a book, uh, which is her first book. And it's really, I'm really grateful for many reasons that it's a really beautiful book, but also because now she knows how fucking hard it is to write a book. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, so now she sort of has some more, more compassion for me when I'm, you know, caught in this, you know, this thing. So hopefully she'll be, be able to remember that. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, what were we saying? Uh, what were we saying? Something about... I, I think it was a compact. great answer. Yeah. But I mean, you know, this podcast and we just kind of go all over the place with this. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but going off yeah. memoir, the kind of like, uh, 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 I like to ask this about writers that do memoirs or nonfiction stuff. Like, do you, does a writer have, and again, this is an endless debate. We're not looking for definitive answers, just your thoughts. Like, kind of this, does a writer have any responsibility when writing something like a memoir? And I mean that in terms of like, you know, when you're writing either, and we could extend this to poetry too, kind of writing confessional poetry or a memoir, you know, do we have any responsibility to the people we're writing about, you know, like the actual people that populate work like that, you know, how someone is portrayed or, or how they come off or is that anything you struggle with? Is it something that if you think about too much, it's just like, uh, you know, you can't do it or, or yeah. How, how do you feel about oh, oh. that? Well, you know, one thing is that there's always going to be other people in, uh, no matter what we do, uh, there's going to be, you know, most clearly in memoir, Nonfiction, fiction, I guess not so much, but you know, a lot of most most books of fiction of people I know when I read them, I can recognize people that they've sort of you know transposed into them. Uh, you know, my friends that have you know I've appeared in I've appeared in various guises in one or two other books. You know, so <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, and I think it's a I think it's a huge responsibility. I think it's a like a, a I think it's a huge responsibility. I, I think it's part of the whole job of being a writer. Uh, especially if you're writing memoir with other people in it, that responsibility to them. Um, and, you know, my main way of thinking about it is to write, uh, uh, to write from a place of compassion for them and not to, uh, not to uh, write to like get even with somebody or to, you know, to prove you were right what do you like somehow like like you have the last word or something? I mean, it's a very, you know, it, it is a powerful thing to be the one writing uh, the story. And I, but I think you, I think you owe it to them, to the people that in it to like really uh, almost try to write it from an egoless place. 
uh, where it's not about you. It's really it's, it's really to understand like why they're fitting into this piece. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm I'm writing right now. Like, you know, I, I hate to say this, but you're probably not going to end up in my book, even though we're having a nice conversation <laughs> now. You know, so so I didn't expect I mean, to be. <laughs> yeah, but hey, if a, you want to, maybe a, the next one I'll be in there. <laughs> having a very nice conversation, but I don't think it's like really part of the book about me living on a boat in my twenties. Uh, so, uh, but, but those, those that do end up in the books, you do have a responsibility to. And so, I mean, part of the reason I'm writing this book now is actually cause, uh, the, the book's about living on my boat, living on a boat, you know, through my twenties. And I, you know, about midway through that journey, uh, I, I became friends with, uh, uh someone in Provincetown named Richard. And Richard and I became very tight. We were really, really good friends. Uh, we ended up living together in Boston, and you know, it was, it was a really important friendship for me. And he, he ended up, he died of AIDS. You know, he died of AIDS uh, about probably seven years after I met him. And he was diagnosed within a year or two of me meeting him. There was a lot of hospital stuff. It was very early AIDS. He died in 1992, which was the height of people dying. Most people died right. that year. Uh, from AIDS, at least in America. I'm not sure around world, worldwide, but in America, at least. Um, and it was right. And then after that, like, you know, the cocktails sort of started coming in and people started like surviving, you know, still a lot of people die, but the height of it was 92. Um, and he appears in the first memoir in another bullshit night in Suck City, but he feels very briefly, like he's just sort of like, and I sort of say that, like, I say that he got, he was, he was tested positive and then I say he died. Like it, he's, he's just sort of like he's he's not like a main character in the book, but uh, uh, he appeared in it. And then so he ends up appearing in the film. Also, he appears in the film. And when they, you know, all they did was they just sort of, sort of said like, I guess in the in the script or something, they said he was this his whole character just said he was gay. And so the actor that played him, who I see, I see now on TV, like selling telephones or something. He just, he kind of annoys me because all he did was he just, he did this really stereotyped gay performance, like really like sort of swishy, which is really fine. If that's who you are, that's completely fine. But that wasn't who Richard was. Like Richard was not like that at all. Richard would have been horrified by this portrayal of him. Uh, and, and, you know, and, you know, I didn't feel good about it, but, you know, there, there was a lot going on with getting the film together. It, you know, I, I couldn't fight that battle. I was just like, OK, that's that sucks. But, you know, what do you do? But then his sister, you know, called me like after the film came out and she was just like or emailed me. And she's like, why'd you do that to Richard? Why'd you <laughs> why'd you do that? And I was like, ah, I know it's terrible. I, you know, but I, I didn't have control over that. I'm really sorry. And that was like, you know, 10 years ago. And then like about 10 years later. It just rose up, and Richard started coming out in the writing, and it, it is a uh, the book is really like like fleshing out that friendship in some way, and, and that 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 thing. It's almost to like because I I didn't he appeared, but that's the thing. Like, did he need to even appear in that book? Maybe he didn't. You know, it's a thing. Like, what you know, but it did seem necessary because we were living together, and there were moments where it, it was necessary. What he said was really important. You know. So he sort of appeared at this moment because he, he's, he's the one who we're living together when my father uh, uh, appeared at the homeless shelter. And so, you know, I got to talk to him about it. And, and so that's why he's sort of in the book. But uh, so now it's sort of fleshing that out. It's fleshing out that that relationship. So I think it's I think it's a, a great responsibility. I think you really do um, need to do it. And, and, to you know, the best way I found is to do it, to write to, from a place of compassion, to try to understand them, even if it's like, the, the person that done you wrong, like to figure out, like I was just sort of, I was, I, was, I, I taught a writing group uh, last week. Uh, have, I taught a writing workshop and uh, one of the guys in the workshop uh, was talking about a, a difficult thing with his father. Uh, and the, what he had written, I mean, I mean he's, he's written other things about his father, probably not, not as bad, but this was pretty bad. It just felt like, you know, he wasn't being portrayed. He was being portrayed accurately, but it was very harsh. Right. And I sort of, I sort of said like, well, there's that, you know, uh, Vivian Gornick thing, and I, I just, I said it even maybe before Vivian Gornick, I don't know, but like, it, it's just like, you know, you want to, you want to make the the villain into a saint, in some way, like because it just sort of comp, it makes things hard, it makes things, it makes you have to work harder to like understand like where they're coming from and why they would do those things, and so I said that to, him. I said, I said, I, you know, and I said like in the in the group, I said like I'm sure that your father was like 
a good person. I, you know, I, I know that he was like at some point in his life, he was a good person. And he was like, and the guy was like, well, why? How could you know that? I'm like, well, because you're sitting here and you're a good person. And I can see his light coming through you. Like, that's the only way that you would actually have that light within you is if you got it from him. Because that's the way the world works. <laughs> you know, like right. you are half, you're half your mother and half your father. And, you know, sometimes you get all the bad stuff. Sometimes you get all the good stuff. Sometimes you get a little, usually you get a little bit of both, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I could see that his light, and it was, it was quite, it was quite moving to, for him to, I think, to see that, to sort of like, to recognize that and to, you know, pull out what is, what is the moment when, when, you know, what, what, what is his, who was his father as a child, you know, what was the moment, what was his childhood like? And sort of have that sort of expand the whole thing. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's this kind of like philosophical thing that I always like, it fascinates me to think about where t this guy says, um, you know, think of yourself like, are you a better or worse person than each of your four grandparents? You know, kind of think back to that and think like, do you think that you're a better or worse person than them? You know, like, cause ideally you would hope to be a better as you kind of, you know, the family kind of expands and stuff, but you know, it's not such an easy question. Yeah. And I think wrestling with yeah. that really, that's the art of like you said, I mean, the memoir or something like that. But yeah. I, wanted to, yeah. I wanted to ask you like, if, is there like, when you finish a memoir, is there like a cathartic feeling? Is there a fear? Like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? Like, like, what, <clears throat> when you finish that and you're kind of like, oh, I did all right, you know, what do you get out of it in terms of writing that kind of memoir style? Um, well, it's not, it's not for catharsis. Uh, I don't, I mean, I mean, I think there is some kind of, there, there is some sort of catharsis, but I think catharsis, to go back to like the, the original, you know, idea of it is more of a daily practice. Uh, that's what the, the Greeks intended. It wasn't something that you, you, uh, you know, experience. It wasn't like a sort of a, a, an Oprah thing where you, you had a moment, you had a revelation and then suddenly you were free of that, that terrible thing that happened to you. You know, like generally it's more of a day, you wake up the same person, you have to figure out the ways to get through it. It's a daily practice. And I think, which I think is just really helpful too, to think of it, it's like, you know, we're always gonna have the same stuff. It's gonna, the dial's gonna be turned down a bit. You're not gonna feel it as intensely, whatever that pain is. Uh, writing might help you with that, might help you sort of organize that thing. But it's also like, you know, the danger is like you're creating a story that, you know, if you write it in a certain way, it creates a story that sort of like, like locks in place. Maybe and maybe it's a false story. Maybe it doesn't contain the fullness of the world uh, because that's all you can do at that moment. You know, that's all we can do. We're always going to do a tell a partial story because that's all we're able to do. We we're never, you know, we, we haven't quite reached the level of God or anything that we can, you know, tell the whole story. You know, the, even the, that's why, you know, the omniscient narrators are so terrifying to me in fiction, you know, that have that <laughs> that that believe they have that power. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so the, the catharsis, like, but but I have felt like things sort of, like like the last memoir, like I wrote the this is the night our house will catch fire, uh, like in every, you know the the story is that my you know my mother set our house on fire when I was six years old, uh, to collect the insurance money, um, we were, my brother and I were asleep inside the house, you know, seems like a dangerous thing, but up until. You know, and I've written about that in every book. Like there's, 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 a, there's a house fire in every book I've written. Like there's just like a house catches fire. Like it's just sort of like a, a recurring metaphor, an actuality, a, you know, it's just sort of a, it's this thing that kept going. But when I first wrote about it, when it, you know, when I wrote about it in, in, in Bullshit Night, and I wrote about it in Some Ether, it's in Some Ether, uh, you know, the, the hives catch fire in, in, in Blind Huber. I mean, it's just like, you know, this is, you know, it's a thing. It's a thing deep in my psyche. Um, so, uh, but when I first wrote about it, like I kind of was at the position where, uh, uh, that, and, and I found out writing uh, bullshit night that my mother had set the house on fire before that it had been a story that just that, um, raccoons had set the house on fire. But then in writing the book, I, I interviewed her boyfriend she was with at the time. And he told me that she had set the house on fire, which is very more believable than the raccoons actually. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, but I, but when he told me that I was in my mid thirties, I was probably about your age, uh, which is, which I think is the age where you, you can start to sort of like look back at your parents and realize that they're not going to destroy you or something. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, you have to, you know, somehow 
our, our development. We have to wait till we get to be our mid thirties or something to do that. Uh, so I, I could, but I looked at her and I sort of, I, I just looked at it with compassion and sort of with, with humor. Like I think, oh yeah, that was a cool thing for her to do because our house was a shithole and we did need the money and she got the money right. and the house got, the house became a little better. You know, like, like we were living in, you know, she was a young single woman. She was 25 years old. She had two kids. She had, you know, she was broke. Yeah. It's not a, you know, I've, I've come up with worse ideas, you know? <laughs> uh, and so that went for a long time, 35, you know, I had my kid when I was like 48. And when my kid turned, so I was in my mid fifties, my kid turned seven and suddenly I'm like, what the fuck? You set a house on fire with a kid bit? <laughs> like, like, like suddenly it hit me like, oh, that's, a, that's psychotic. <laughs> you know, but it took me that long to figure that out. It took me a long time to figure that out. And, and so the first story I had of it is like kind of like, I don't know who, you know, what people thought when they read the book or something, but like, you know, I know some people like some people wrote like, you know, like Mark Doty wrote uh, on the cover of like some ether he wrote, like, this is one of the most terrifying families in American letters. I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck? Like the Manson family, like they're pretty terrifying. Like <laughs> the Wuthering Heights. I mean, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah, just, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I thought it was a little over the top, but then like I, I sort of, I think he was seeing something that I wasn't quite ready to see, you know, uh, like Absolutely. he was really taking, taking what I, what I was writing about and not like just filtering it through like whatever defenses I needed to have. So, yeah, so writing that book and going through that, what I had to do to write that book, uh, you know, this is not a house will catch fire. You know, it was a lot of therapy, a lot of like, you know, a lot of stuff happened to, to write that book. And yeah, so it's the stuff you have to do to write the book that's cathartic. The writing the book can fucking kill you. I and mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's not like if you, if you go for like, you know, if you if you go to like think oh I I, I want to heal myself by writing a book I think you, I think it's the wrong I would not suggest that I would suggest you go to therapy you know <laughs> and if you're lucky you'll be able to write the book once you sort of get your shit together a little bit you know yeah absolutely <laughs> I I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of sobriety as well kind of. I just yeah. had an interview with this guy. I just wrote a great memoir, Jared Clickstein, and he was addicted for about a decade, like homeless, living on the streets in Skid Row and stuff. Wow. And he wrote this great memoir about it uh, that just came out. But I, I just... What's it know, called? What's his, what's um, his book called? Crooked Smile. Crooked Smile uh -huh. is the name of it. Yeah, go back and listen to that, listeners. It's, uh, it's yeah. there. But... Uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, what motivated that? You know, how did you, because he was talking about kind of like, it's almost a spiritual thing to get over kind of addiction or to, to go into like a sobriety uh, with your life and stuff like that. And it just kind of, you know, what motivated that? Was there an event? Was there mm -hmm. something that happened? Was there just yeah. kind of, you were just sick of it? I mean, you know, how did you, because I mean, and I think people underestimate how difficult that is too, but just kind of, how did you get there, you know, to where you are today, you know, many, many years sure. sober and, and all of that. Well, it's, I can, you know, I can just go back to like, I'm reading my notebooks now of when I was using. And it's really fascinating because I was just like, I was clearly moving toward like trying to figure out my relationship to drugs and alcohol. I mean, that was the clear thing. Like that was like really clear. Cause I'm like, I ended up taking like, uh, um, Studying, because I, you know, like I said, I dropped out of university, out of out of UMass, uh, after during that semester with James Tate, because my mother died. I, you know, I, I I sort of stopped functioning for a while. Uh, I uh, and then over the years, I started working at the homeless shelter, and then I began like at a certain point, I sort of started to get my bearings again, and I started studying. Like I I, I went to UMass Boston to study to be a social worker. I took this thing called uh, social uh, seminar and social services or something. It was like, you, you, you got like six credits. You got credits for working in a social service agency and then credits for taking the class. So you could get like a bunch of credits at once, you know? And that's the, like, I, I needed credits to graduate. So, so, and it was really fascinating, but a lot of it was around drugs and alcohol. And I was working with like hardcore addicts and hardcore, you know, I, I was taking people to detox and I was studying about addiction. And I was like, really like writing like all this stuff about like, like, the, you know, exactly like all stuff around, like the consequences of addiction, that the, the you know, the, the treatment for addiction, the, the, the physical, physiological effects in your body from addiction. Like, like I was just like, and this is like two years before, like I, I got sober and I, I wasn't really thinking like I need to do this myself. I was just like, yeah, this is, but the whole book is like, so the whole notebook, this, this one notebook of this time is like really sort of heartbreaking 
and, and beautiful. So you can see that I'm, my mind is working toward that. Like my psyche is working toward I'm, I'm doing, I'm working out and writing. I'm, I'm, you know, there's no reason I, I didn't have to go work at a shelter. I didn't have to go put myself with like hardcore addicts that are like the consequences of right in front of you every fucking day. People are dying like from their addiction every day. And uh, yet, you know, I, 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 and I, but I didn't, I didn't think I, I didn't want to quit using drugs or alcohol. I had no desire to, right. there's no desire whatsoever. Like I was like, I was like, no, no, I, I want to figure out how to use drugs and alcohol until the day I die. I don't <laughs> want to die. I don't want to die when I'm 30, but I don't, you know, I want to, I want to live a long, a long fucked up life, you know, <laughs> like, like, like mildly fucked up. Like I didn't think it was like that fucked up. It seemed like mildly just, I wanted to be a little fucked up all the time, you know? And, uh, uh, and then like it just but you could see that I was wrestling there was some part of me that was wrestling with that like in these notebooks it's really quite it's quite poignant for me to read that it. be like oh like I was like on that path it wasn't suddenly it wasn't like suddenly one thing happened like okay you got to do this like when it was suggested to me quite strongly I had you know I'd, I'd been with a I had a girlfriend for like 10 years uh you know it was it was sort of you know, you know, nowadays you'd call it polyamorous, I guess, but we were just like, you know, fucking around on each other. Right. Really? Like it was just, it was messy. It was really, it was messy at times. Sometimes it was really beautiful. She was really great. I, I saw her last week. She, you know, she's, she's, she's a great person, you know, one of the loves of my life. Uh, but it was like hard, like to be with me in my twenties was not a, a fun thing. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to be, I didn't, I didn't want to be with me in my twenties, you know? So, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, you know, so she, so I, you know, I ended up like, you know, fucking around and she found out and, uh, she said like, unless, unless you go to therapy, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta end this. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go to therapy. But I really just wanted to go to therapy because I, I, the writing wasn't happening. Like I couldn't, I, I was like, I, I think I can write, but I just can't fucking, I can't, my mind is so confused. So I went to therapy and the therapist said, uh, asked me how many drugs and alcohol I did, my, you know, my history, my intake history. And I told him, I never lied about it. It didn't seem like, it didn't seem like, cause I was hanging around with like hardcore junkies and it didn't seem that bad what I was doing. Like, you know, like Richard was a junkie. Like, like, you know, Ivan was a junkie. These people were like, like the, my closest friends were like hardcore heroin users and I was not. So I was like the guy, the responsible person. <laughs> and so I told the, I told the, the therapist this and he was just like, Oh, you're you're an alcoholic and a drug addict, and I'm like, and I was like, yeah, well, I know that, but that's like, that's not why I'm here, you know, like, like th that's something else. Let's let's not talk about that. Let's talk about something else. He goes, he goes, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste my time with you unless you, it, you know, attempt to get sober, like, you know, you know, get sober, go to go to meetings, get sober, and then we'll then then see how that goes. And I didn't think it would be that hard, and it was really fucking hard. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, like <laughs> it was not easy. It was like, and, and mostly what was hard was, you know, the physical stuff wasn't hard, but, um, like it wasn't like I went through DTs or anything like that or withdrawal, uh, uh, except psychically. But, uh, the hard thing was that suddenly there was a, a, a flood of emotion, uh, that came cause like, you know, drugs and alcohol, like just numb your, like limit the emotional range that you can feel, uh, that's the purpose of it is like to, to sort of have like not to be overwhelmed by the emotional energy. Uh, and it works really well for a while until suddenly you're, you're sort of, you know, flatlining through life. Uh, and so I, um, uh, I did it. I just, so I just started to have this like rush of emotions, like this range of emotional things. And a lot of them were hard. A lot of them were ecstatic. It was just like, it was wild. It was a wild run for like the first like year or two of uh of sobriety uh and that, that's what sort of kept me going because it was really a rush too it's like this is this is like a i feel like i'm in the fucking circus i'm in a carnival <laughs> i'm in a, an emotional carnival so it was like this is like whoa this is, this is wild uh but it was good and, and i really liked it. i really liked like I, I liked the community i like the i like the fellowship they as they say of uh of meetings uh i didn't like the book too much i didn't like the i didn't like a lot of the stuff they said i thought they were really corny uh but now I now I'm I'm, I'm fully in it. I, I've I've been doing meetings for a long time, and and I I think it's a uh, kind of a profound uh, spiritual program uh, that's that's kind of amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I went to a meeting yesterday. You know. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of, I guess, yeah, the thing is like the, you said the book that's kind of all those kind of NAAA stuff is is tied up in kind of religious stuff, right? I mean. It's not religious. It's not religious. No. It's spiritual. Yeah. Spiritual. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not it's not connected to any religion. Yeah, 
And I, and I wanted to ask you, going off of kind of the spir spirituality kind of aspect to this, and uh, since we're on the topic, uh, meditation. You know, I, I've you've, in researching this, you've spoken about the practice in many interviews and stuff before. And, and uh, I'm a fan of, you know, public figures like Sam Harris and stuff who preach the practice often. But I wanted to ask, you know, what does meditation do for you? You know, how do you use it? Uh, when did you start and why? Uh, you had to bring up Sam Harris. Um, oh, are you not uh, a fan? Are you, not... <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can look at look look at uh, the ticking is the bomb. I, I sort of talk about Sam a lot in that. He's he's he, he's he's a he, yeah he's an advocate of torturing Muslims. Oh um, right, right. That was during his uh, his end of faith era, right? He, yes, well, yes, yes. Well, yes. he's still yeah, and he's still he's still on that train. I mean, he's 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 you know he's he's come back in with a vengeance with the the whole Israeli, uh, you know, Hamas thing. You know, like. Uh, he's got the solution, you know. Just gonna, <laughs> just gonna torture these, torture these Muslims a little more, you know. So yeah, he's 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 a, he's a fucking problem. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, hugely influential. It's terrifying. It's terrifying how fucking influential he is. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, so. Yeah, the meditation thing, it's, you know, I've, I've, I've just been doing it for a long time. I've been doing it and I do it with all my writing workshops. We all meditate during the writing workshop. I, I meditate before I write. Uh, I find it's like the best way to uh, to get to the, the yeah, to get to that subconscious stuff where all the good stuff is sort of hiding. Uh, um yeah, and I've, I've just done, yeah, I've done meditation retreats, like, you know, like, like seven day, five day silent retreats. Uh, which I find really actually, you know, they're, they're hard and then they get really sort of ecstatic by the end. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's not like, I'm not like, you know, fully, uh, connected to a Zendo right now, uh, in my life, but I, you know, I, like I say, when I, when I teach writing workshops, meditation is always a part of it. Uh, I'll be teaching one like next week. So we'll be meditating, you know, quite a bit during the week. Uh, yeah. So Did yeah, you... if I, if I find it just. Yeah, I find it's just it's just a. I, I think it's as important as the writing in some in some ways. It just feels like it's like, like it doesn't matter what comes out in the writing if you have like a daily practice of this and just trusting it, then the writing is gonna sort of like you're gonna find you're gonna find that that that. Um, uh, you know, we want to read people's work that's that's sort of like in, in a glimpse into the interior life, and this is like a way to this is like a portal right into it. Uh, you know, through meditation, you, you sort of get into this stuff that's not like the surfacey stuff that you think you should be writing, but this sort of strange, terrifying, ecstatic things that are hiding within us. So, yeah, yeah. And you've said that before, that it kind of helps you get into the kind of like, for lack of a better term, the subconscious, right? This kind of the ether that everything's kind of swimming around in and kind of, is it like the relaxation? Is it just kind of like the no judgment like being able to not judge yourself while you make mistakes in like the writing process and stuff or, or... um yeah i mean it, it's it's like an alpha state or something it's a whole other state it, it's yeah probably yeah it's, it's we, we try to write like quicker than we can think you know that and that was the thing i ended up studying with you know with with carolyn forche uh after uh i had read her book like you know when i first got sober i was able to go study with her uh and I studied with her for like three summers in a row. And that was the thing of her to, to she didn't do meditation, but it was to write fast as you could think. Uh, and, and now mine is sort of like more folk. It's a little more focused. It's like from meditation, we sort of set up our page. It's really writing into these moments in our writing that we want to go deeper into. So we sort of get the, we get it all set up ahead of time. So it's not just sort of like, ah, oh, I'm going to surprise myself. It's like, okay, we, this is where we're going. We're going down this field, you know, uh, you know, uh, so it's a little more, it's a little more focused, uh, in right. a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I mean, we always ask this kind of question too, a little later, but is that, is that a, you know, kind of like a vital part of your writing process and routine to do that? Like, cause you said, you know what I mean? As you teach it in like the workshops and all of that, like, well, I do, I do, I do most of my, like, like, like generative writing, like getting the really valuable, stuff that then I end up like, like working with, I get it out of those writing workshops. I, I do writing in the writing workshops. I also write with the writers I'm working with. And, you know, I've done like, uh, you know, I did two workshops in August. I just did one in September. I'm going to do one in October. Like, you know, so it, and it generates a lot of work 
and now I'm taking that work and like how, seeing how it fits in, how I can fit it into the larger thing I'm working on right now. So there's these, so that's, that's, that's my process right now at the moment. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And moving on again, maybe this is spiritual too. Kind of, I want to talk to you about the avant-garde side of kind of literature and art. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about this idea publicly a little bit where I've said that kind of, I, I'm not sure that we even know what avant-garde art looks like kind of in the 21st century in kind of film or poetry, fiction, even music, you know, um, and I just kind of, you know, I often see people pointing to the avant-garde of the 60s, 70s, you know, maybe even the 90s, kind of this. But I always like, but that's like mainstream now, you know, kind of accepted. Like it did its job of pushing the boundary and now we've kind of moved, you know. But I just wanted to ask your question, you know, what is the avant-garde in the 21st century or, or your thoughts on that? Like where where is it? What would it look like or any ideas like that? And again, we don't need definitive answers. This is just your thoughts, your ideas, Nick Flynn's. Sure. Like in the, you know, the sixties and stuff. I mean, I think the avant-garde uh, where I go to is like sort of fluxus stuff. Uh, and I, I don't think that's been incorporated at all, like into our daily practices or, you know, into the mainstream at all. Like, 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 you know, for one example of fluxus work, um, like, you know, Yoko Ono's like, like sound pieces or, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think they've been, I think there's, there's still, it's still out there work and it's still, but it still does point to like what places where people can go. We get little glimpses of it. Um, and the avant-garde always going to do that. It's always going to show us like sort of moments, like, like it's going to open a door that we hadn't imagined before. Uh, you know, it's really important to have an avant-garde, uh, uh, just, a, a you know, to have it, to have, a, not in the mainstream to have this thing. And it doesn't, I guess you could say it gets incorporated, but I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of like incorporation of really good avant-garde work into mainstream art these days. Maybe you have, uh, I'm trying to think of, yeah, I'm trying, what do you mean? What, how, how do you see it incorporated like into work right now? Well, I'm thinking <clears throat> mainly in terms of the experimental music and art that was happening at that time and thinking like the Captain Beefheart era in terms of music and stuff. And then kind of, I, again, maybe mainstream is the wrong word for that then. Cause yeah, it, I guess it'll never quite be mainstream, but it has influenced it kind of done its job. You know what I mean? Like kind of like done its mm -hmm. job to push a little boundaries and then the mainstream kind of goes a little bit further to toward that direction. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about, you know, nowadays like I, I don't know i guess i'm looking for it maybe and i'm and I, I think you see it in your work and stuff uh but yeah i don't know i'm just yeah tossing uh, an idea around <laughs> yeah like uh yeah i'm trying to think like in mu musically like uh i just went to a listening party uh up in red hook new york and tivoli new york uh with a, a guy joe hagan who um uh, he, wrote, he wrote the book Sticky Fingers, which is a biography of Rolling Stone magazine. Um, you know, he's a, a friend and he, he has these he has these friends that get together. And they, they, they just try to bring these really out there records and and, and, and play them uh, uh, and try to figure out, like, OK, what is this? Like, try to like, they, you know, they don't tell them what it is. Like, OK, what do you think this is? And, they, you know, it is like trying to find like the strangest sort of like music from like and it's a it's a very particular thing. because also they're used they're on vinyl. And so. You can always guess it's like it's, it's going to be from the 60s you know it's, it's not it's going to end like in like 1979 or something you know when when vinyl sort of stopped happening or you know like or maybe the 80s mid 80s at the latest you know like by the 80s we're, we're buying vinyl that much anymore you know uh and so you sort of you sort of figure out the the error of it and stuff and and they do try to they, they play stuff it's like like some mainstream people that are just we're pushing even their stuff into like other realms I like just sort of like wanting to play like, you know, into like uh, into this sort of more experimental uh, sounds. Uh, but those are the songs we don't know. I mean, these are the songs we don't remember, but right. it maybe helped them as artists. It helped them as artists to sort of like like get something else in there, you know, uh, you know. And, and then you get to hear moments of like an album like Pet Sounds, which is like maybe completely experimental, really, right. like in some ways. But yet it's completely pop, too. It's a very right. strange, wild, wild mix. Uh, to have like a, a genius like that that's able to sort of have those two things happening at once and that stuff survives too like that's like you know that's one of the one of the greatest albums ever made oh, yeah. you know and it's and it's a completely unique and and, and personal and and you know un unclassifiable and you know 
and and you'd say you know that that's bringing like the avant-garde into uh this moment and then yeah and here i guess you do hear like you know you brought modest mouse and stuff like that i mean there is like sort of like you know we recognize that sort of when people are pushing into some other realm right that feels like that feels new i mean you do want to have this new thing even you know chapel roan now maybe has some you know moments of uh of, 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 yeah, just touching on it. And, and I haven't listened to all of their work, of Chapel Rome's work. And so maybe it is like stuff that's like even more like experimental, you know, within right. it, you know, that's like sort of pushing it. It's, it's, I wouldn't be surprised at all uh, if it is. And then in writing, I mean, you get a lot, you get a lot of this. There's all sorts of, I mean, right now in poetry, it's like, you know, wildly. I mean, so it's almost, I mean, there's, there's a whole, the whole tendency toward like the project book now is like uh, a thing that's sort of, you know, really like and, and taking on like a political historical moments, almost like, you know, documentary poetics as a project, as like a, a period of time. So there's, there's a lot of uh, stuff in it. I'm not sure where to classify that. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel really avant-garde to me. Uh, um, I, I, but sometimes it does. Like I, I think even the early versions of that, like I think like Solmar Sharif's like look felt very sort of like fresh and new. And even uh, um, uh, uh, whereas by Lely Long Soldier felt like you know like it was doing those things like right in the edge of um, uh, the avant-garde and documentary poetics and and you know having these things. And sometimes like now it's sort of shifted so much into that right now that I'm not I'm not totally sure. Like I, I don't. I'm not completely convinced by some of the things that are happening right now with that movement. Like maybe that's it's 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 gone down a dead end or something right. in some ways. Which I mean, maybe that's inevitable. You know, when you're trying to push boundaries to hit those dead ends and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did yeah. you by chance? Uh, I'm a big movie guy. Did you see Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid? Bo is Afraid. No. 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 I, that was one that I when I saw that it felt like avant garde to me. Like like oh this is. Uh, and again, it's still kind of mainstream because it's Ari Aster stuff, but it's, it's still kind of like it felt like he was really pushing limits, like the limits of what like a, a movie would look like and feel like in the plot of a movie and how you could really kind of string it together in these, yeah. these very abstract ways. It was that was something that I was thinking. I was like, huh, is that the avant garde right now? And of course, you know, we yeah, don't know. Yeah. But yeah, that was just. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That sounds great. That yeah, sounds great. Very interesting yeah. stuff. I mean, I'm connected to a group down in in Houston called Nameless Sound, which uh, they do. They're very like experimental music uh, group, and yeah, it's exciting to go see. I, I try to bring my students to see them once a year. Like they have like a they have a weekly event. It's just always sort of like blows their minds because it's just just music like they've never seen heard before, never seen before. They're just like, this is what is right. this. And I, I really like to do that to like get them to see see the possibilities. And so there's still a whole and they're they're sort of connected to they come out of like Pauline Pauline Oliveros uh, deep listening practice. You know, she was, you know, the very influential avant garde musician who just died a couple of years ago. I'm working with a guy um, in a couple of weeks, uh, David Rothenberg, who's a musician who came up and we have a pond on our land and he does these pond concerts and he takes a a hydrophone, which is a microphone that you can put underwater, and he he amplifies the sounds of underneath the pond, and it's like these these crazy sounds, and then he plays along with them, uh, and so he does a lot with nature, and he does a lot with like sort of uh, like uh, collaborating with nature, uh, and that's his sort of uh, his medium, and he finds ways to amplify the, the sounds of nature and to to do it. He's he's, he's really fascinating. I, I I hadn't met him before. We just came and did this thing, and now we're gonna work again. In, in like 10 days or something we're going to do another we're going to do our first thing together that was just him me watching him I'm like hey let's do something together so um so we're going to do something where there'll be like nature david rothenberg and me doing poems right so That's... i have no idea how it's going to go i have no idea how it's going to go but it's like it's it's we, we got a venue we got a date we got a oh yeah It'll happen. We got an audience so do you want do you want to plug it or i guess if it's going to happen in a few days this might not be out yet but uh, well, it's, it's going to happen at Omega on October 10th. Omega, which is in Rhinebeck, New York, uh, on October 10th in the evening, probably seven o'clock at night or something. That's going to be yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, so. did you, by chance, this is just my, by Isaac Brock from Honest Mouse, his side project, Ugly Casanova. Did you ever uh -huh. listen to that? Not, 
No. No. Did, no. No. I'm, I'm very bad. I'm a very bad fan. Like I actually don't want to know who makes the music. <laughs> right. Like I, I have no idea who Isaac Brock is. Although I love Modest Mouse. Right. Like I've never heard that. Name. I've never heard that name before. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like I, they, they often disappoint me. They don't always, but often like <laughs> like if I go and actually hear them, run like oh that's what you think the song's about. Oh fuck. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, like I think that you know sometimes they can be brilliant, but sometimes not. So I just. <laughs> I, I find it best to live in my own, like my own interpretation of the song, and not not read too much about them, not know too much about them. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's the authority, especially when it comes to any type of art, music, art, like your interpretation of whatever you're hearing, reading, seeing, like that is what matters, you know. Yeah. What the artist yeah. said, kind of, and you know, I, people have criticism of the death of the author. I'm a fan of the death so, of the author in terms of that yeah. stuff. Like, it's so up why to we, us. Like, yeah. Then why, then why are we doing this podcast? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you notice I didn't ask you so much about what each one means. Yeah, about what okay, does this okay. poem mean? What does my favorite poem mean? And then, you know, kind yeah. of meeting your heroes type thing where yeah. <laughs> you're disappointed, right? Yeah, but they, I could, uh, hopefully I've disappointed some people. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But I, I wanted to ask you this, too, that this is another kind of more philosophical question. You know, why do you think artists want to push boundaries? You know, what is it about pushing the limits that attracts kind of writers and artists? And again, this is just your thoughts, you know, no definitive answers. But what do you think about that? Like, well, I mean, when you read, you know, you sort of like uh, every every era has its it falls into like a, a style or, a you know, something that we, we recognize. And then you sort of you start to like not take it in too deeply. Like, oh yeah, I've heard this before, you know, with music or something like, hey, okay, this is just sort of like that. This is like that. And yeah, you want to sort of like find something that hasn't been done before because it does, it does open up new possibilities of consciousness uh, to do that. And I think, I think we need to sort of stay in that, you know, we're in our own era for a while and then someone sort of like, like, like moves beyond moves it to another the next era often it's a younger person it could be an older person uh you know who's just sort of like or someone who's just always been in the outside suddenly like it's brought in and people like suddenly like well there's this other person and that's the thing about that listening party like this is so much music that uh that is was happening that, that i mean that was one of their points is that all this music was happening at the same time where there's you know we only know like five songs from this year but all these other songs were being made that we don't know that like that like we're actually as good as any of the things that we know like you know what what makes something rise to the top you know and like and if this other thing had risen to the top the entire history of music might have been different you know like they you know like if, if it wasn't the rolling stones but it was like uh you know this this other band that no one's heard of what would that do what would that do to the whole culture you know like it's it's a fascinating question uh and and you know and then you read a book that like you know, they just suddenly like like just just twist the world in a certain way, and it, it, it and it has to be in a in a way. Like I just read um, uh, Jenny Erlenbach's uh, Kairos uh, book, East German uh, writer. Uh, she's you know born in the late '60s, went through the whole you know so born in East Germany, so under under communism, under the Stasi. And now she's, you know, she's gone through like, you know, the wall coming down and, and coming out and, and, you know, she's written a lot of books and she's, she's very well known. Uh, but it's a, it's a kind of a beautiful book. It just has like this other way of seeing the world, like this other sort of like, and it, it, it comes from in some way from the East German temperament. I mean, I, I went to, I went to a lot of like communist countries back in the day because I just thought they were so fucking interesting, like a whole right. nother way of a whole nother way of thinking and seeing in the world and, uh, uh, you know, just being in the world, like going and going to countries where there's like no, no advertising, like, ah, oh, this is strange. This is like, you know, kind of refreshing, but, but then there's also no food, you know, there's, like, there's, there's no anything, you know, like, it's just like, okay, that's, that's, I guess we could live without that too. And like, you know, I don't know. It's just like a whole nother consciousness like that right. exists parallel to our consciousness so then to have this sort of blending having her come and you know, like writing you know being a writer that we're reading now that, that a lot of people are reading right now is like really beautiful so uh yeah just to get yeah, it just to, re to read other literatures too i went to a, a literary festival in uh in mexico city back in may and uh it's just so beautiful to see like the 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 literature of the world like it's not like there were only a couple people from the United States there and the rest were just from all over the world. And it's just like the, the, uh, 
the the energy and that that we're not like the center of the world here you know that there's other you know people in africa are going to be seeing the world very differently you know you know arab culture is going to see it very differently than we see the world you know and it's uh it's really fascinating to see how stories are told and how they're you know what a poem is and yeah Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And, and that aspect, I like that you said this kind of aspect of refreshing, like when you discover something new that somebody pushed a boundary and it worked like, it, you know, because yeah. obviously people can yeah. do that and it fails, but it's like it worked and you're like, whoa, like that, like yeah. this, yeah. this, this, this feeling of like, I don't, I don't want to say euphoric, but I almost kind of like a euphoric feeling when you discover like, I want to do that, like, or I want to try yeah. that or uh, somebody yeah. pushing the limits a little bit, like it just... Yeah. really refreshing and i guess yeah discovery maybe like i i mean you know like we're always searching for this like i, I don't know who it was but somebody said you know some writer of course you always hear things they're like uh it's more about discovery than creativity you know when you're kind of writing stuff down uh you know you're not so much creating as you are discovering i guess i, I don't know i mean what do you think of that like this yeah they had that that jack spicer quote uh the, the poets think they're pictures, but they're really catchers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that we're, you know, we're just sort of like, sort of have to be, you know, receptive to the world and open to it. Like, you know, like that Erlenbach book. Yeah, there's a few things that she's doing in there that I would like to try. Like you said, like, I would like to be like, huh, I wonder how she did that. Like, and that's, that's why I would always read like, you know, Beckett, because I'm still, oh, yeah. I still can't, I still don't know how the fuck he does it, you know? Master, like I could read, yeah. I could read Beckett just like all, you know, for the rest of my life. I've read him, I've read him, for, you know, for 40 years. And I'm still just like, how the fuck is he doing this? You know, I don't really understand it. Whereas other people I can understand very quickly. And that's, that's the thing. I can sort of put it down and walk away. And I'm like, right. yeah, okay, I get it. I get what you're doing. It's cool. And then suddenly I put the book down. And I'm like, two months later, I'm like, oh, I never picked that book up again. Right. With Beckett, I'm just like, I don't know. What the fuck? From sentence to sentence, I'm like, how is this happening? How is this happening? Yeah. How is it like... How, is, how am I, why am I crying and laughing in the same, same breath, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is, this is a Beckett podcast. Yeah. We're, we haven't covered him yet, but oh yeah, we plan to eventually <laughs> just nice, but, nice. We mainly haven't covered him because yeah, I don't know how to approach it yet. <laughs> like maybe we'll, yeah. we'll get something to so Maybe we'll have to have you back on for that. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you this too, kind of not switching gears, but kind of you're one of the few living writers to have themselves portrayed in a movie. You know, like most writers have to be dead <laughs> before that happens, right? <laughs> I just want to ask, like, what was it like <laughs> watching someone play yourself on screen? And also, how do you feel about Hollywood kind of doing you dirty by casting Paul Dano as yourself <laughs> in the movie uh, Being Flynn? Why would that be dirty? He's great. Paul well, no, no, is fucking of course, great. of course. Yeah, I think he's a great actor. Yeah, I, mean, I just I've been yeah. like, you know, usually get upcast into like, you know, having like a Brad Pitt figure or something playing yourself. Like, he, yeah, that's what I look like. Exactly. like. Paul, 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 Paul Dano's good looking. What are you talking about? He's like a good looking guy. He's like, <laughs> a little autistic. I was, I was, look. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to have Paul Dano. Like I was just like, yeah, it could have been better than Paul Dano. Like. No, no, they were they were they were suggesting some sort of like you know, uh, you know more more conventionally handsome people, I guess you'd say, but like it was really about like, you know, like Paul Dano, you know, could go up against Daniel Day Lewis right. and there will be blood. Like, are you fucking kidding? Like, like he could like you know like and I hate to say it, but like you know like. Uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio against Daniel Day Lewis kind of looked like a piece of wood. Right. You know, like yeah. like <laughs> like whereas whereas Paul Dano was like fucking a living thing next to Paul next to Daniel Day Lewis. I mean, you couldn't do better. Like it was great. Uh, yeah. So the whole thing. I wrote a whole book about that. There's a whole book called The Reenactments, which is about the being you know the film being made, and it's it's a longer answer uh, to the question like what it's like because you know I, I I was there on set every day. I was part of the the you know part of, you know, choosing Paul to be, to play me. You know, I met Paul, uh, uh, before, you know, we went out, for, we went out for, for lunch, uh, right when he signed on and just cause he wanted to sort of like check me out. And I was, I was checking him out. Like, right. you know, it was like a really interesting, I only, you know, I only knew him from his work. Uh, and he seemed like a really, just a, he's, he's a smart guy. Like he's like really like a, a reader and, and, uh, uh, big music yeah. guy too, right? Like, yeah. He's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He would like, yeah, I'd have his headphones in. He'd, I'd ask him what he was listening to. I think he was listening to the Heartless Bastards yeah. for, uh, during that uh, at some point. 
it was um, it was great. It was a, it was a wild, strange experience. That's the thing. Like the the uh, the uh, another bullshit night in Sex City is kind of a common story. It's like everyone's trying to figure out who their parents are. You know, everyone's trying to figure out who they're. You know, where they come from. Like you know, why this is things are like they are. It's a it's a it's a common story in some way. You know, everyone and everyone has some some trouble comes to their life at some point, you know? Uh, whereas the reenactments is like completely fucking bonkers. It's like, you know, like you say, like it's not a thing that happens <laughs> to many people at all where like, you know, Robert De Niro is going to play your father, you know, like, right. like, it, you know, like you, know, you get to do this. So it's, it was a, um, it was great. And I just, I just sort of went with it. I just sort of like, I, I took, did what I do. I just took a, you know, making a film, making films are this incredibly boring work because it's like, <laughs> hours and hours where you're just like waiting for them to move the lights and like waiting for like the one you know you, you do like a page a day or something uh maybe two pages a day or something and it's like you know it's not a lot of words and they just sort of like it takes forever to just get that done and <laughs> just you're, you're sitting around a lot so i just had no push i was just like writing down everything i was looking at like oh this, this is interesting and and that this sort of that's how the book came together really uh it was just the process of making a film um and my feelings about it and, and you know feelings about seeing like you know Paul Dano, like, like, and, and just these people acting out like these moments of my life, like, uh, that are, you know, they're, it's dramatic. So they're, they're quite, there's a lot of painful moments, you know? Right. Uh, but, uh, they did, they did it with all of them. You know, Julianne Moore is my mother and uh, De Niro is my father and Dano is me and everyone else. My, my wife is in it. Uh, you know, she worked in the shelter. She was a, a shelter worker. Uh, and, uh, the um, they all they all just had such integrity. They they were like really like artists, like really like like right. taking it really seriously and like asking me like serious questions, like what so what would what what is this? They really want to get it right, uh, whatever that means. I'm like I don't know. I don't know. right, <laughs> get it right. But they they you know they wanted to sort of like have it somehow reflect and because none of them also knew none of them had been in a shelter before either, so none of them knew anything about homelessness. So I was like the you know the authority on homelessness, you know somehow. So uh which is which which makes sense i did work with the homeless for like eight years you know so i did have some knowledge that they didn't have so it's a big part uh, of the story yeah like but yeah i just think yeah. it's crazy i just wanted to ask about it yeah <laughs> yeah you know having to like watch somebody be like oh that's me <laughs> like up on the screen uh yeah. oh, that's supposed to be my dad <laughs> like that like you know that that's <laughs> Well, there are there are many there are many hints because it's Paul Dana and they all they all would have Nick Flynn written on like the there was a there was a trailer in the East Village it's, uh, on the first day there's a trailer that said Nick Flynn on it and uh, so I, I went to go in it <laughs> and then a guy stopped me and said like I was like well I'm Nick Flynn he goes no this, this is it's Paul Dano's trailer it's not your trailer this is like Paul <laughs> Dano's trailer and then there's a body double for Paul Dano which is called also called Nick Flynn. And then there's Nick Flynn. Nick Flynn is like a, an eight year old. And like, there's, there are many Nick Flynn's around. It was like a whole constellation of, of, uh, of us, you know, <laughs> floating around. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Again, that kind of collaboration keeps coming back. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's one of the most collaborative art forms I'd say film, yeah. you know, have, have yeah. you been approached for doing any of your other stuff in films in terms of, you know, your stories or, well, we just did a. We just. I was just in Berlin, and a, a, an avant-garde filmmaker named uh, Beth B just took. Uh, this is the night our house will catch fire. She made a short, and I would say it's an avant-garde film of that book. And then I went and performed it live on stage. Like we took the. It was a voiceover of me, and then we took the voiceover out. And I had. I had to like sort of like recite it, you know, from memory to these musical cues. It was like very choreographed into musical cues and stuff like on a live stage with a big projection, like three screens behind me projecting the film. Um, so, I mean, that was like the, yeah, that's a, that was a version of something. Yeah. But no, no, no other big Hollywood thing has, has happened yeah, so far. Not yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your latest book, Low, a collection of poems. And we I always like to ask this question, writers, where does the title come from for that? Because I know it's hard to come up with titles for things like that that encapsulate an entire book. You know, like, how did you come up with that? This is the one um, question I'm asking where I'd be more asking your ideas, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Than my interpretation. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Well, no, I want to know your interpretation of it. It just seemed like the right title for the book. Like it, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, thought behind it in a way. It doesn't even come necessarily from anything in the book. Like often there'll be a line from the book, like some ether, there's a poem called some ether and, you know, the captain asks for a show of hands, blind Huber is a character. I mean, they all sort of have, uh, but the last few books though, like um, my feelings and I will destroy you. I gave them both to my editor and they, and those poems didn't exist There's poems in those books now called my feelings and I will destroy you. Um, but when I first gave it to him, like, they, they weren't in it and he was like why are you calling it this why why are you calling it this and so i had to write a poem to justify why i was calling it you know my feelings uh you know which seemed uh yeah which i which, which was a good thing to do it was good and this one he didn't ask for that maybe he just gave up asking me like <laughs> this one this one is called low and it just felt like um i, I like i like all the possible permutations of it like this sort of uh you know, positive and negative uh, permutations of it, like, you know, uh, you know, low down and uh, low brow and, and uh, down low. And, uh, you know, there's all these sort of like, you know, it had like sort of dozens of different like things that went around that circled around the idea of it. Uh, and all of them are just suggesting, um, uh, yeah, so, something like, you know, I like the idea of it low to the ground, you know, just that it's like something that's it's very sort of, uh, uh, you know, demotic in that way. Like it's 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 about, you know, that it's a it's about being on the earth and stuff. So uh, I think that was it just felt like the right title for it, really. So, yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. It's just because everybody always overthinks this kind of shit. And then, I just yeah. of like, and then all of a sudden it's, it's like, ah. I liked it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it sounded like seemed like the right title for it. Uh, and you know, and then also the band Low was like a nice thing. So I got to I got to just ask ask the band Low if I could use one of their lines just to start it out. That was fun to do. Are you a fan of Low? I've never listened to them. No, never. Oh, you're in for a treat. You gotta listen to some Low. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're what amazing. are they like? Are they uh... sort of sort of uh, it's it's just a couple. Uh, uh, and, and and she just died last year. Mimi Parker died, uh, and now it's just the, uh, the the lead singer is is left. His wife died, um, but the the two of them uh, made music for like a long time out of Duluth, Minnesota, uh, and uh, it's just very moody and very sort of like like interesting lyrics and just like it's 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 a cool it's really really great music. Yeah, I love I love Low. Yeah. That's, That's the thing too. It's almost like it was nice to do that. Like, I mean, my hope was that, you know, we would do a collaboration together. But then his wife died, and it, he just, yeah. I was like, yeah, we'll do we'll do shows together. <laughs> like, I have a book called Low. Yeah. So like, I, I, I sent them the book and stuff, but yeah, we'll see. Absolutely. And the last couple of things, I they're more like very writer centric here. Where we like to ask this of writers: uh, What is your writing routine like? What do you like to do in terms of getting your routine or your methods? Um, I just like to set up the, I like to set up the page in some way to know what where I'm going the next day. Like just so I'm not like sort of uh, just like like uh, sloshing around. Uh, I like to sort of think like okay i need to I, I would like to be in this this world right this this moment of this world uh and see if i can sort of like solve this or, or work through this uh this thing um so that you know that's that's kind of it it's just sort of like like doing a little work and everything sort of feeding into it a little bit but i don't want to get too i don't want to be too, too covered by it because um uh i i want to I, I do think that like being too immersed First in a book is like not healthy uh and i would like to i would like to like it, it seems like it, it takes away from life in a way so I, I try to really like sort of contain it like okay just get it set up and then go and then be fully present with my my family my friends with the outdoors with life and then come back into it so to have it sort of pulse between those two things you know when i'm in it be fully in it and then just be able to put it down and leave and not sort of drag it with me everywhere I go. So that's sort of 
the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's always interesting because some people have these elaborate rituals, you know, before they sit down and then other people are just like, ah, a cup of coffee in the morning and, uh, you know, go to it. Uh, no, nothing special. So it's always just our listeners like to know that kind of thing because it is, it will vary yeah. so widely from writer to writer. And, well, well, I've, 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 you know, shockingly, I've, I haven't had any caffeine for three years now. So, oh. uh, uh, and so this, yeah, this will be the, this might be the first like caffeine free book, you know, we'll see how it does. You know? <laughs> I always, I always like to mix it up a little bit, you know? Absolutely. Why, why did you stop caffeine? Was it just, uh, I, I've stopped it before. Like it's, it's, you know, meditation stuff, like they're, they're, they're kind of like, like, yeah, you know, it is, it is a. Uh, it, it it doesn't it isn't it isn't it, it does it, it's fun in a way but it also it also is like it, it it doesn't really focus you in a certain way it's sort of like it, it makes you jangly and stuff so it, yeah. It, yeah I don't know if, I don't know how much it helps really so yeah right. That's great. A little experiment. Uh, this is another question we always ask writers. And again, we don't have to get into any numbers or details, but this we like to know, how do you make a living? Do you make any money off the literature? Do you have to have a day job? All of that. Oh, no, I, no, I, have, I definitely have a day job. Yeah, I teach one semester a year down at the University of Houston. Um, and then I teach these workshops, uh, you know, five day workshops, uh, uh, different places. Uh, you know, I've started like doing my own lately in the last year. I've done a couple of my own. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the writing thing, I mean, the writing is hard to make money off it. Even if I right. write a memoir and stuff and, and like, you know, it takes me like five years to write it. You get like, you know, even if you got like a hundred thousand dollars for it, it's like $20,000 a year. I mean, it's right. not like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's not going to keep you flowing, but it is nice. It is nice to have like a little, a, a little burst of money come in, you know, if they give you that much money, right. uh, you know, like it's nice to have that come in. But then, you know, taxes, it just goes and right. just, you know, agent. the agent takes yeah. the trouble. Because it, you know, it's, all, it's, it's all like, you know, you don't, you, you barely notice it actually after yeah. a while. Like it just it gets folded into the larger, you know, thing. So it's fine. Everything's fine, really. Uh, you know, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. We, we like to ask that just to kind of help dissolve the illusion that people have of, of uh, you know, all oh, these wealthy oh, writers. No. And <laughs> like, oh, I'm making millions oh, no, off no. of my book because it won an award. And uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Any, any. I mean, you know, it, it was good. Getting the movie made was definitely a chunk of money. That that right. a chunk of a chunk of money came in from Hollywood, uh, and that was nice. And that money's, you know, you know, gone somewhere else now. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. you said you're doing your own kind of workshops outside of your kind of your teaching at University of Houston and all that. Like, is that yeah. just something you wanted to do? Like, kind of. Oh, no, I, I, like, wonder... I like the workshops a lot. Yeah, I like these workshops a lot. Like I say, I do a lot of my writing in them. So uh, it's just a community thing. I, and usually it's just sort of uh, by invitation. Uh, I just ask people I've worked with before or something if they oh, want to okay. do another thing. I mean, other people could, could ask if they can be part of it or something. But I, it, it, it's only like 10 people. So it, doesn't, right. it fills up really fast. It's, it's kind of filled up immediately. So. Uh, right, I was, your reputation. Yeah. I was wondering if you had a bunch of crazed fans or something that were <laughs> like, like, like knocking down your door to get in there and stuff. So I know no, but, but, but has that now too, where he's got a lot of fans that are knocking on his door to get because he runs kind of a private workshop stuff too on his own outside of teaching stuff. And it's, I'm just curious yeah. about how that works. And well, yeah. he's well, he's also got like a whole like like Substack thing going on, right? And like, yeah. Like, like, you know, that's, 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 you know, George Saunders has that too. And I, I've thought about that, but it seems like, yeah, it seems like a lot of work, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> it is. like yeah. yeah, you know, like to, I, and I, you know, my, my writing energy is like limited and I, I sort of want to just put it into the books, you know, right. uh, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a book about, you know, the craft of writing and that would make sense to put it on Substack because that then you can sort of like, right. you're feeding it, you know, it's sort of like you're working through something. It's a different muscle i think but maybe not i'll see yeah that's it let's talk about a little chunk of change i mean it wouldn't be much money but i bet you'd have a bunch of people signing up from the day you launched it in terms of, oh nick flynn has it i'd be please you know shut up and take my money meme you know like uh that'd, that'd, that'd be nice <laughs> uh, that'd, that'd, yeah but then you, then you have to show up every week right, you have to give yeah. them something you have to give them something and like <laughs> I don't know. That seems like that seems like a lot of pressure, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's know. different. It's different than just yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like right now like I I'm just enjoying what I'm writing right now. I'm just enjoying it cuz like 
there's no pressure. No one's waiting for this book. No one knows about this book. No one, right. you know, it's really just me. Just, you know, if I find it sometimes, you know, you know, a couple of weeks can go by. I mean, I, I try to stay activated in it every day. I mean, that's the thing too, the writing practice to try to stay activated in it every day. Like if you were on about something just to do like half an hour a day at some point in the day, just like, like open it up, look at it, maybe move a sentence around just so that you're, you're, you're not like sort of your subconscious isn't like leaving that space completely, uh, I think is really important. Um, and, and, and then other days you just, you just, do more other days you're in it for three hours you just, you right. do a longer run you know so yeah absolutely yeah. another question we like to ask writers that come on what advice would you give to writers out there who are maybe just starting out maybe trying to build something on their own what kind of advice would you offer them if you're hearing this it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored uninterrupted full access to this podcast Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. Um, advice to offer them. I mean, I, you know, I always love Grace Paley's advice, just low overhead. Uh, <laughs> you know, her two word advice is just, you know, the, the more you get tied into like, you know, having to pay like a lot of rent or something. Uh, the less time you have to work, to write. And it takes, it does take a lot of time at the beginning to, uh, to write. I was very lucky. I had, I, you know, I had very low rent in, in Brooklyn in the nineties, uh, all through the nineties. Uh, you could still get a, a cheap place. And I, I moved in with a friend who had a really cheap place and we just split the rent. It was like $300 a month I paid. And, you know, now like the rent is like 3000 a month. It's just like, I don't know. And, and people haven't like the, 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 you know, the wages haven't gone up that yeah. much. Like, like, <laughs> like people are making 10 times the money they were making back then. Like, like what the fuck? Yeah. Is that even 10? That even, might even be like 100 times. Like, what's oh, yeah. 3,000 over 300? Is that like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, I guess that's 10 times, right? That's 10 times. Uh, uh, add a, add so, a zero, yeah. Add a zero, 10 times. So, um, so you know, so, uh, just to find that, find community, you know, like like have a community, have a, have a writing group. Uh, I think it's really important to have a writing group, to have a daily practice, which is like, uh, you know, to be, keep activated in the work like every day, even for half an hour, just to have some to, to stay in it and to read stuff, to have like a thing. It's the same as a Buddhism thing. It's, uh, you know, Buddhism to have a practice is it's a tripod and it's the the, the Sangha, the Dharma and the the uh, daily practice. So the daily practice is the meditation the Sangha is the group you, you work with, and the Dharma is the text that you read of uh, other, you know, the, the folks that came before you. And that, I think it's the same for writing, too. I think it's the same. Just you have to you should keep those three legs of the tripod active, you know. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the last couple of questions here we like to ask, because we talked a little bit about how, you know, you're filling your brain with everything you're consuming there and to kind of are you reading anything good, watching anything good, listening to anything good? And this could be anything at all, like, you know, garbage reality TV or, uh, you know, a great book, like, you know, anything like that. Anything that's just bouncing around in Nick Flynn's head kind of right now as he's. Uh, well, my daughter and I, 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 I watch a lot of things with my daughter, like and, and we did watch some like real garbage this summer. Uh, we traveled around. We watched. Uh, oh, my God. What was it called? perfect match like a reality show of like yeah. these these beautifully vacant people on like an island like and it was, <laughs> it was, and it was just like it was kind of like my and i'm like wow like what, what are we doing watching this this is so crazy this is so crazy uh and then now we've, we we rewatched uh severance because she's really into severance and she really is dying for the new season of it which won't come up until january so we watched the first season again uh, which was very satisfying. Yeah. 
Severance was very satisfying. Uh, I, like I said, I read that Jenny Erlenbach book. Uh, it's the last novel I read. And then I'm, <laughs> I have over on the table over there, I have uh, uh, The Power Broker, Robert Cairo. But it's, it's very intimidating to open that, though. It's like a thousand pages. Right. Uh, but it's, you know, now it's my semester off. And I'm like, okay, maybe this is the time to do it. Like this, like uh, it's, uh, it's a book that sort of has always circled around me. And I'm, I'm sure it's amazing. Uh, I just have the sense that it's an amazing book um, from all I've heard about it. Uh, yeah, uh, and I, I'm going to be reading tomorrow at the Brooklyn Book Festival. Uh, I have a gig at the Brooklyn Book Festival, and I'm going to be with uh, Marie Howe, uh, and she has a new book, Collected Poems, out, uh, which is really beautiful, you know, has her five five books of poetry, four books of poetry, plus new poems in it. Um, yeah, it's a really great, uh, great book, so... That's fantastic. I love having like a big tome just kind of looming over you, like on the shelf or something, and you just kind of look at it like every once in a while. You're like, I, I, yeah. I know there's I did, something in there. <laughs> what? I, I did that with Executioner's Song a few years ago, and it was just like so fucking satisfying. It's like yeah. such a good book. You know, I was like, okay, now I've, I've done Executioner's Song, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, the last one we always ask writers here, what are you working on now? I know you kind of answered this already, but yeah. Yeah, the book, book about. Uh, Look about living on a boat in my 20s, uh, you know, 10 years, 10 years, I lived on boats, 10, 11, 12 years, I don't know, a long time. Uh, I lived on boats and, uh, uh, yeah, so it's that, sort of like, because it's a question, it's like a question like that, you know, it's a question people are always like, you know, like, like I've always wanted to live in a boat. <laughs> like, really? Like, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a lot to it, you know, there's a lot to it, so, uh but I can see it. It is, it is a beautiful thing. It was it was beautiful. Like uh, the days that were beautiful were very beautiful, and the days that weren't beautiful were really hard. You know, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, that was all I had, Nick. I mean, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on, and taking the time to do this. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Great to great to finally meet you. You know, it's great. Do you still have your partner too? Uh, no, no, no. And in you know, the world of podcasting, it's a labor of love here. And after about a year yeah. or so, she was kind of, uh, she moved uh, on. Yeah. She was like, ah, you know, doing this every week, even every other week, I only do it like bi-weekly. And even then it's, it's, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta keep it going, you know, like a sub stack or something. Yeah. It's like, oh God. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thanks. I'm glad, I'm glad I just, let me know when it comes out, you know, when you, when you pull it together. So absolutely. Yeah. It'll be, I'll send you an email with all the links and stuff. And then it's uh, usually a couple of weeks delay, Okay, but, but yeah, yeah, I'll send you an email with all Excellent. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great to meet you. Are you in Baltimore right now, or uh, I'm in Vegas. I've been living in Vegas, Vegas? the last five oh. years, but yeah. Oh, how's that? Uh, it's great, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I've it's Vegas is always one of those things, especially when people write books about it. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm gonna write about the real Vegas, and it's about these four blocks downtown. And they're like, oh, that's yeah. the real Vegas. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is a city of two and a half million people. And it's yeah. this sprawling suburb where your neighbor is worked as a waiter like their entire life. And they have, you know, make six figures, retiring with a pension, has a pool in the backyard. Like it's not quite yeah. Yeah. The, the glitz and glamour of everything that you see in like the movies and all that. And I mean, there is plenty of that. You know, there's plenty of that. And there's plenty of the down and dirty kind of, you know, homeless yeah. drug addicts and stuff like everywhere. But like, it's also like, it's really weird vibe. Like I love the kind of vibe of it. Uh, I love the weather of it, even when it gets really hot here and stuff, but we came out here for my wife's career. It was, uh, nice. yeah. So I was, you know, and I was just adjuncting at the time. So it wasn't like I had a career or something holding me yeah. <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. So I adjuncted nice, here for nice. a few years and then, you know, yeah. Now you're making the big bucks doing podcasts. Oh so. yeah. 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 I think I'm up to about yeah. $20 a month in subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a labor of love for sure. But yeah, again, it was an honor to have you on here, Nick. Yeah. It was just yeah. so great to meet you even through a screen here. And uh, yeah, I hope to have yeah. you back and maybe we'll do a back in episode or something. And, yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, Andrew. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks, you. man. Take Thanks, man. See ya. See ya. Heavy. Bored. I am heavy, heavy, heavy bored. I may say the mail is entirely hostile. No! 
Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.